Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, King Newbie and Talking Crow. It's Matt Gorg Freeman. How's it going today, Gorg? Scott. <laughs> Whoa, you can say my name. Gorg. That's... <laughs> I really... <Scott. laughs> Matt, I really didn't know where else to go with that intro, but I think you handled it about as good as anyone could. Okay. All oh, right. You're just going to keep going. Okay. I mean, that would have been funny if I just did it for the whole episode, right? That would have been really funny. That would have been really funny. That. And yeah, everyone would have really loved a full episode of you just doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> this week on the show, Black House continues as we work our way into part two of the novel titled The Taking of Tyler Marshall. This week... The Taking of Tyler Marshall. <laughs> we'll be discussing chapters five through seven of King and Straub's novel um, in which a young boy is taken and a blind DJ rocks an old folks home. So, you know, the yin and the yang <laughs> of existence. Yeah, a little, little from the two the two columns of human experience. <laughs> Matt, what do you think uh, of this week's reading? Oh, my God, Scott. Oh, my God. What the <laughs> hell, Scott? <laughs> It gets, it's really good, right? That's, that's what, what you mean. What the hell? <laughs> you doing um, okay? Well, there's a there's a part where a mother finds all of her son's organs. That's that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll talk about that, I guess. <laughs> Still kind of processing it. Um, sure. But then also, there's a delightful dance at an old folks' home, so that's fun. Yeah. Um. Man, I'm really enjoying this book, Matt. I, I just wanted to get that out there here at the top. Like, I'm loving my time with it. I, 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 I was pretty mixed on this thing the first time I read it, but this time it's it's really singing for me in all the ways I want a Stephen King book to do it. I agree. Yeah, I mean, other other than that first chapter, which I still maintain is just not my specific cup of tea. Um, the last the last two weeks of reading have been absolutely delightful. Uh, and by delightful, I mean horrible, um, <laughs> but in a way that's extremely compelling. Sure. And uh, so I'll tell, I'll, I'll preface, okay, parts of this story I'll save for the appropriate parts of the, um, of the, uh, the, the discussion. But like, I was mainly listening to these chapters while I was on my long walk around the neighborhood that I try to do every day. And I have never been so like, tense and agitated and like in my head while listening to anything on that walk like it was it was deep like i i i don't know if anything's ever disturbed i don't know if anything i've read has ever disturbed me as much as this week's reading actually this is so great and, and i i want to talk about this a lot and i want to circle back uh in, in a, a bit to the word that you used there which was tense which it absolutely is and i want to talk about why because you know it's really interesting that the the whole section of the book is titled the taking of Tyler Marshall. Uh -huh. So the tension is not from nervousness about the outcome. Right. Um, no, no. And so that's worth talking about and we'll, we'll definitely get there. Yes. Right. I mean, just to just, I, I would say it's tension about how things are going to react to, to that. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, so let's do it. Let's get into it. We begin with chapter five, our first chapter in part two. Um, and we start at the Maxton Elder Care Facility, where we're going to spend, you know, probably most of this week's reading, actually. Um, we're with Pete Wexler here, the janitor, the father of Evie Wexler, who is is Tyler Marshall's stupid bully friend that uh, that we we met last week as he was flicking off our heroes. Uh -huh. um, Pete Wexler, Matt, <laughs> is... Such a good example of a Kingian creep, right? A guy who is just no good, but also in this mundanely normal and average way. Like, I love the description here. It's easy enough to overlook Pete Wexler, a one-time nondescript youth, final grade average at French Landing High School, 79, who passed through a nondescript young manhood and has now reached the edge of what he expects to be a nondescript middle age. His only hobby is administering the occasional secret savage pinch to the moldy oldies who fill his days with their grunts, nonsensical questions, and smells of gas and piss. So that's Pete Wexler, a guy you would totally forget about and also is just mean to old people for no reason. Yeah, he's just a great little sketch of a dude who sucks right here. Yeah. Um, you know, he's mean hearted. He's he seems to be self-loathing the more we get to know him. 
and he's just incredibly resentful of the world. Um, but, you know, never in a way that feels cartoonish, which I think is no. one of the hallmarks of, of the King villains is that they can feel so, so kind of archetypally awful while still being quite distinct and realistic. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's so real, right? Like, like, he, and the way he's drawn is kind of this, this guy who's just like, was kind of going through the motions of life, not the smartest guy in, in the room. Sure. But he's just like a guy who's just going through the motions and just like kind of bumbled his way through his life until he's, he's here when we meet him, just a janitor in this old folks home who clearly does not like any of the people he's cleaning up after um, and treats them like shit and is creepy in a bunch of other ways. We'll talk about here in a bit. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it, I think this is kind of interesting because I sometimes tend to think of the people who work at old folks homes as being um, extremely, you know, um, selfless and, and moral people just by virtue of the fact that that's the job they do. Like sure. They, yeah. They're, they're caring for people who are in need all the time. Um, and I guess it's just it's an interesting juxtaposition to have this guy who um, he he doesn't give a shit about any of them like he's just doing it for the paycheck. Yeah, I mean that seems to be a general trend in Maxton's right. Mm, yeah. do, do any of these people care about any of these these uh, any of their residents? Uh, certainly, the boss doesn't. We know right. Pete doesn't. We see one of the other orderlies who is kind of annoyed by like I guess there's 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 a difference between you know, not liking people and being annoyed by having to clean up after someone like you can like your job and want to help people and also still be like, oh, I got to clean up this old man's shit. I don't want to do that. Like, yeah. it doesn't make you a terrible person to be in like, oh, I, I really don't want to have to clean up after this guy. But yeah, everyone here seems to have just this this stripe of venom in them when dealing with any of these people. Yeah, you got to think maybe the boss kind of specifically hired people who he knew didn't care too much so that they wouldn't yeah. blow the whistle on him. Well, and he definitely sets the tone, right? Like if he if he was setting the tone of, you know, these these are people in our care, we're doing this very important thing for them. Um, you need to treat them with respect and dignity and help them. Uh, maybe they would act a little bit better. But because he doesn't care about any of that, because he's in it for the money, um, no one else really cares either. Yeah, good point. And I think it's that's really important because into this comes uh, our symphonic Stan, who kind of transforms the place very quickly. I think that's really important. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. But before we get there, we're here with Pete because he observes Charles Burnside wandering out in the halls. Uh, he lets him carry on because he sees that he's shit himself and he doesn't want to have to deal with that. So he waits until one of the orderlies find him because Pete Wexler is a classic person. <laughs> it's uh -huh. just wonderful. Um, Charles Burnside, who, by the way, here definitively we learn right now that this guy is indeed the fisherman or at least partially right because we see this line here all at once bernie the human shit machine is gone in his place is carl beerstone who reaped the young in chicago with such savage efficiency carl and something else something not human he it grins so so bernie is definitely the fisherman but but that's not all that's going on here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bernie, Bernie is several things, one of which might be the fisherman or the fisherman comes out of Bernie or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a lot going on. You know, the, this Chicago reference to him being like, you know, was he a serial killer in Chicago? If so, is this a reference that I'm supposed to understand? Is this some other real world serial killer or is this just a, you know, in text reference to something that will that we'll find more about later? Um, sure. You know, open parentheses right now i don't know um but you know the idea that there's something not human to him is also interesting because i mean plenty of you know options that could be something something magical something of the territories uh, it's not it doesn't seem quite as simple as just like oh this is his twinner possessing him we've seen that before if it were just his twinner then i then like the idea that it's not human um doesn't quite fit so it's yeah an extra wrinkle on the idea um, that it would just be, you know, the twinner possessing him and then him possessing the twinner, the, the, the thing that we're used to. Yeah. I mean, th there's obviously something more going on here because as we understand it, Bernie himself is, is suffering from Alzheimer's, right? So like he is not all there and yet something is, is possessing him as a good word that you said there. Um, but we don't, we just don't know what to deal with, with this yet. Right. Right. 
but it, I mean, I, this this puts us in the place though, where you know I said a couple of weeks ago, I, it was kind of a leading question, I guess. Do you think this is the type of book where the mystery is who is the bad, who is the killer, or the mystery is uh, how do we catch the killer? And this book with with this chapter, we firmly plant ourselves in the ladder, right? We know that Bernie is the one that takes Tyler Marshall. Um, we can then assume that Bernie is the one that has taken the other three children as well. And so who is the killer is a question that has been answered here right now. Um, and obviously it's more complicated than that. There's some magical shit going on, but that, that puts us firmly in the second type of mystery story in which we know who the bad guy is. And now we have to watch the good guys try to figure that out. Yeah, that's true. And you know, one of the other features of a really good mystery story is what's going on with the detectives themselves, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of, we've covered a few different detective stories on our book club podcast. And the part that always is the most fun to me is, is like the detectives are usually like really interestingly screwed up people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and following them and, and, you know, how, how they untangle things and, you know, they're usually untangling their own issues as they're untangling the mystery. Right. Um, so taking that, angle and the idea that we, we we kind of know jack but we kind of don't um anymore that that sounds like it's gonna be really fun to me yeah and i think this is another thing where there are kind of multiple ways to handle this right i think a lot of the agatha christie-esque murder mystery stories the detective themselves is really barely a character you know poirot it's not that he doesn't have character in the christie stories but like he's really just the method of of revealing other characters character and the mystery itself and true that that does not seem like that's this is the, that type of book you know jack is already a, a, a much more complicated and interesting and fascinating character than hercule poirot ever was no offense christy stands <laughs> i like agatha christie a lot uh, and i love poirot but it's just a different kind of story and it, this book has kind of declared exactly what kind of story it's going to be yeah i guess i just call it a more a more modern detective story sure you know. sure i'm making some assumptions obviously but that's where i think we're headed <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so we now get to what is obviously the most important moment of the entire book so far, a moment so disgusting and disturbing that you just kind of feel like you want to put the book down and walk away. Right, Matt? Um, yes. Yeah, I'm talking about when Pete catches a glimpse of Rebecca uh, Viaz's underwear as she stands on oh. top of the ladder. Oh, yeah. That That's was, what you thought. That I was met, the right? worst part of the chapter. <laughs> So I, I, I joke, but I, I'm really fascinated by this interaction because I, I think the thing to talk about here is not Pete, who is just doing what like every creepy King character has done since Salem's Lot Jahubis, right? Like this mm -hmm. is just this type of creep King character is always going to leer at women in a really uncomfortable, weird way. So that's not too interesting to me. But I think what what Rebecca Villas's reaction to it is is the most interesting part to me. Because she reacts in a very specific kind of way. And and I guess we should declare here at the beginning of this whole conversation, um, we're men. And at least me, I won't speak for you. I, I've never experienced anything remotely close to what it must feel like to be creeped on and ogled like this. Right. I just that's not a thing I've ever experienced in my life, at least not in a way that I was aware of. Um and most likely neither have our two authors. They probably, probably not uh, making some assumptions, but uh, uh, that aside, I think this is a really fascinating way to really inspect this Rebecca character. Yeah. Uh, because her reaction to it actually says a lot. It's, it's mm -hmm. not maybe what you would expect, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we don't know much about her yet. We know that she's sleeping with the boss. We know that um, and and seems fully aware of his crimes, which says something a little bit about her character, that she's just OK with that. Um, and, and we'll spend some more time this week learning about her. But here in this moment, she looks at him ogling her. And this is this is what the text says, Matt. She looks down at him, sees the stunned look on his face, notes the direction of his sight line. Her expression softens a bit. As her dear mother so wisely observed, some men are just fools for a flash of panty. So I think, you know, the, it's one thing to like have a woman notice this kind of uncomfortable, creepy ogling and just be kind of so desensitized to it. that They don't even react anymore that that perhaps once upon a time they got angry and annoyed at this. And 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 that that would be a fair reaction to this. But perhaps you have a character who's experienced this so many times that she's just indifferent to it or or at least on the surface, just just like just 
has no reaction. But Rebecca does. M- it's not just not having a reaction, right? Because she moves into this interaction annoyed with Pete Wexler because she's trying to get him to do something and he's not doing a very good job at it. So she goes into the interaction annoyed. And then when she sees him doing this creepy ogling, when she sees what's distracting him, her ass, her expression softens, as the book says. She she later calls him a lovable fool and, and smirks at the boner he's getting from ogling her in her workplace. Which is, and I think the distinction is important here, Matt. She's not like flattered by Pete's attention right. here. She's just kind of like, oh, oh, you, oh, oh, you. I think we were talking about this earlier. And one of the things I said, it's like, it's like if a dog like walks up to you and like starts sniffing your crotch, you're not like offended by the dog. You're just like, <sighs> dogs you know yeah, it's right. just a dog being a dog and that's kind of her reaction to him which is up oh, this is just what men do it's not offense it's not anger and it's not it's not a uh, f- flattery it's just uh, this is just this is just a dog yeah right and she's she's not annoyed with it if anything i think the the subtext is like ah oh, this situation just got a little bit easier because he's been uncooperative and kind of a dick to her and now yeah. he can and, and now she knows like oh well i can just kind of get him to do what i want because yeah i have him by the balls as it were. yeah i mean it's so transactional to her and like she even says a little bit later in the chapter like like uh the the show he got was was well worth the exchange for a measly a measly task so like to her this is all transactional and and i think by the line here that he says as her dear mother so wisely observed it makes it clear that this is learned behavior right that she learned that this is the way men are and this is the way we should react to them and it's just kind of really a really fascinating way of seeing uh, the king and straw draw this character to be this way because it's not at all what i would expect if if i were ever ogled in this way i probably would not react this way at all um and it really it really is a great way of defining something about her here yeah right it's a very interesting character setup right because the first time we see her there's almost just a very very superficial kind of oversexed jessica rabbit cartoon that 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 has been yeah. you know we we we're left with no details and then and now and now we see that there's kind of a different uh a different internality than we would have expected and we'll see yeah. from here i guess what we're going to do with this character like what like what is the purpose of setting her up in this way how are we going to evolve this um this character mm-hmm. so we cut from this uncomfortable scene to the real meat of this first chapter oh my god <laughs> <laughs> do you, oh my, did you like that oh, oh my god. Like that? scott that's <laughs> the darkest joke anybody has ever said on on any any of our podcasts and we did a show on a story where a woman at one point walks around with a bunch of people shish kebabbed on her arm yeah that was good i like that too so good job there i guess thanks man it's my job uh joking aside though i i do think that this this next section is some of the most disturbingly horrible and i will say wonderfully written parts of the book so far the actual taking of tyler marshall himself right um i i think this is just a master class in in writing in tension in in setting and in kind of cinema i think there's a lot of this that again we've talked about this before but again feels very cinematic to me yeah i i, I think so what's funny is I, I probably have less good memory for the actual writing of these of this bit because i was so like um sucked into the world of it I don't know if you know yeah. what I mean there, but like you're paying less attention to the verbiage because you're like physically there, you know? Yeah. And that's, uh, that's an important distinction because when I say good writing in this case, that's more what I'm meeting. I'm not meaning the yeah. individual word usage. And I think there are two different types of good writing when you say that there's, Hey, this was a greatly constructed sentence. And then you can also mean, Hey, this sequence of events was just fantastically paced out in a way that attaches and and attracts your attention in the perfect way and i I think this is definitely the latter sometimes the best sentence is the one that kind of disappears and you you, you get the impression without even being aware of the words i think that's absolutely true there are moments where you should be able to step back and look at a sentence and be like damn that's some good shit right there but there but yeah when a book is when a book and maybe a story more broadly is doing its job maybe you're not even paying attention to that kind of stuff 
yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I think that's, I mean, that's often my goal. I don't know that I ever achieve it, but I, that's how I think about it anyway. Mm-hmm. So uh, we begin this whole section with Ty as his three friends and importantly, his buddy system. That w- This is the whole reason his father was not worried at all was because he had his buddies. Uh, they leave him behind. They rush off up the hill. They're a little bit bigger than him and he can't keep up on his bike. Um, I-, I like this beat in the section, though, where Ty kind of looks at them and kind of realizes that they suck and maybe it's OK for them to leave him behind, both literally and also like proverbially in the friendship um maybe i just won't be friends with these guys anymore uh, i i think that's a really interesting beat and it shows once again tragically how different and exceptional tyler marshall is yeah it's important to characterize him specifically if you know so that we actually care about what's going to happen to mm-hmm. him but um yeah yeah good 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 for you ty you ditch those losers and you go <laughs> have a long full life oh no um actually i'm curious as, as a kind of a, a side note did you ever have a friend like these guys are to Tyler Marshall were like, like I th- the one thing I think about here is that Ty's parents are like, I don't like these guys you hang out with. Don't do that. And Ty was probably when they first said that was like, Oh, come on, mom, they're fine. But like, he secretly knows that his parents are right. And he just doesn't want to admit it. Cause I distinctly remember having a friend like this. His name was Chris. He got me in all kinds of trouble. My parents did not like him at all. And they would tell me not to hang out with him. And like, I secretly knew they were right <laughs> and I just didn't want to admit it. Yeah. I don't have a story nearly as clear cut and dramatic as that, but I definitely had a range of friends who were either clearly more like mean hearted than <laughs> me. Like they'd be really mean to, to like their siblings or even like my brother. Um, and I was always just like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> um, and, um, and just, kids who got in way more trouble than me who I was friends with. And then I would, you know, that's always, it's always fun when you're a kid. Cause you're, you're sort of like mesmerized by that, but also you're like, I don't want to get sucked into this yeah. vortex of trouble you're creating. But also I am very curious to, uh, d- to see what happens here. Um, <laughs> it's so funny because I mean, my wife is in education, so she deals with parents all the time who are absolutely convinced that their child would never do this or that. Uh-huh. Um, and, and like, I was definitely the type of kid who like didn't break the rules. Like I just didn't, I, I I was, if you told me I couldn't do something, I pretty much didn't do it because I was very af- afraid of breaking rules or laws or anything like that. And so when I did get in trouble, it was sincerely usually because I was with someone else and they pulled me into the trouble that I would never have instigated on my own. And so like, there's definitely a difference between no, my kid would never do that. And yes, they absolutely would. And the only reason my kid did that was actually because they were around someone else. And that it's, it's actually very difficult to, to know that difference. Um, and I, I think the only person that knows it for sure is the kid themselves where I can definitively say, yes, I definitely would not have done this bad thing if I was by myself. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, what I notice as a parent is that um, my kids are like me. And so if they're going to do something that gets them in trouble, it's, it's somewhat likely to be a thing that I w- would be okay with them doing, even if it's technically against the rules. And so I'm going to defend them, even if they're in the wrong. Um, I'm not saying that as like a, as like a, you know, don't be that parent, Matt. My wife has to deal with that parent all the time. Well, I'm, I'm using myself as, as just an example of like the way people are, um, which is that like, if your kid does something wrong, they're probably just, they're probably doing the sort of thing you would have done because they're by their nature more like you than they are like other people. And so that's, that's the mechanism of why, of why we overlook our children's faults, I think that's all i meant sure sure i i guess that's correct <laughs> don't 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 be that person though matt strive to be better than that well i'll try your kid would definitely definitely did that thing that your teacher's saying they did is what i'm saying oh i know that <laughs> it's just that i don't think it was bad <laughs> Um, Okay, so (laughs) from here, we cut to Bernie, who is standing in the men's room, looking out the window at Ty Marshall and disgustingly drooling. And and I think this this moment kind of establishes the structure of this next part of the chapter, right? We're going to be cutting back and forth a lot. We're cutting between Ty himself, we're cutting between Bernie, and then we're cutting to people on the periphery of them kind of observing the situation. And we're doing this as uh, 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 like 
to ramp up tension as Tyler's martial doom slowly, slowly meets him. Um, it, it's a really wonderful structure. And I think, you know, this is the way you kind of cheat. We've talked about this before, but this is the way you kind of cheat in books to ramp up pace to make it feel like things are moving faster. You just cut back and forth between things a lot. And that automatically creates this feeling of, oh, things are moving now. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think it makes it cinematic too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so while Bernie is looking through the mirror, we get this. The boy in the mirror is not one of this creature's poor lost babies. Ty Marshall has lived in French Landing his whole life and knows exactly where he is. But he could be. He could very easily become lost and wind up in a certain room, a certain cell, or trudging towards a strange horizon on burning, burning, bleeding footsies. So I'm wondering what you make of all this, Matt. This is a little, a little confusing verbiage here. What, what, what's your opinion? Yeah, well, based on not only this, but several other bits of confusing verbiage throughout the <laughs> whole book so far, I have this just laughably optimistic theory that the fisherman is indeed not actually killing the children but rather taking them as as the title of the chapter says taking them to some other realm where you know he he keeps them alive but feasts on their suffering or you know what have you in in the in the fashion of some of these mm -hmm. king monsters we've seen before uh, it's it's not that i don't think that king and straw were up to ch killing children like that they, they, they totally kill children um it just really seems like there's something more going on and the shape of what that i mean okay let me put it another way something more is definitely going on um <laughs> the question is are are the are the children being physically you know killed in the sense that we would imagine and i know i know we find dead bodies you know the the authorities have found dead bodies but you know uh -huh. it's magic okay i can I, i'm allowed to hand wave away little details like that um but we'll sure. see, you know, I, I'm doing my best to, to put together what could be going on based on this. But, you know, we have this, I, what, what, I'm, what I'm riffing on here is this idea that like, he specifically says, you know, th they're going to become lost, they're going to end up in a room, they're going to end up in a cell, they're going to be, you know, are, are these metaphors or are these literal, uh, is this some, some place in the territories or in midworld where he's actually taking them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's not a poor lost baby, but he could be. He could be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right. And I think it's very important, like the, the usage of the word taken, the taking there, the, not, not the killing of Tyler Marshall, not the murder of Tyler Marshall, but the taking of Tyler Marshall. So, yeah, I mean, like there's magic stuff going on. I think maybe even you could assume at this point that there perhaps is a lag between the taking of a person and the killing of the person that, that perhaps these other three victims, you know, there was time between when they're originally taken by the fishermen and when the fishermen uh, returned them, I guess we will call it uh, dead. We, we yes. just don't know yet, but I, I think, I think you're, I, I understand that I see exactly why you're coming to these conclusions. I just came up with like the li literally the craziest theory I've ever come up with for any of these books. Oh, lay it on me, man. Okay. The okay. It's, it's, it is kind of horrible. Okay. So the theory is they want these specific children. Um, maybe these are, I don't know, breakers or something. Who knows? Okay. I, don't, I don't know how dark tower we're getting here, but he wants these specific children and he wants to make it seem like they're dead. So he's, grabbing the kids and then he's finding their twinners in in the territories and then murdering them and putting their bodies in the real world so he gets to keep the children and then their twinner is murdered and maybe that's that works somehow i don't know <laughs> no see this is cool because you've kind of married dark tower to talisman in a very simple and fascinating way yeah like so. maybe this guy's job is to hunt down you know breaker children um you know get candidate breaker children and you know tyler marshall has that kind of quality that you associate with a, a child with the touch where they're just kind of they're just kind of more in tune and empathetic and 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 kind um so this is it's gonna be really funny when i'm wrong about everything but it, but um you know, it's fun, fun to think. It's about. great, man. I love it. I love it. I love when you when you go full full ham like this. Good. Uh, Good. Right or wrong, it's always fun. So okay, uh, Bernie calls upon Gorg, uh, who we will see is uh, a black crow that materializes in the bushes and and manages to call Tyler over to him by saying his name, which is a very important lesson that I think you should teach to your children and everyone should teach their children. If a if a crow ever materializes in front of you and starts speaking English to you, uh leave uh -huh. go away don't talk to the crow 
Um, so Scott, here's <laughs> here's the rest of that story. So I was out on my daily walk around the neighborhood, uh-huh. listening to this part of the audiobook, uh, which you know from this point uh, on for the next chapter or so is just incredibly dark. Yes, next, next couple of chapters really. Um, and just as I got around to the Gorg part, um, I happened to be walking near an elementary school where children were playing outside for recess. And there was a lone crow sitting on the hill watching the children. I mean, how fucking 19 is that, man? I, there, there doesn't get much better than that. I was pretty, I was, this is maybe part of why I was more upset by this reading than anything else. But, but I think it was, I think it's just genuinely a very, very tense and upsetting um bit of bit of storytelling not just this but the next chapter too for sure yeah it definitely is and i mean i it's not that i'm saying i disagree with you about like how upsetting this is but i don't think i've ever felt it at the level of drama that you felt it i mean i think you messaged me earlier in the week basically saying what you said in the intro which is like oh my god scott what the <laughs> fuck is this and and my honest reaction to that was i ha- i hadn't read the chapters yet and i was like what <laughs> is there something happening here that I'm not remembering? Because I, I just don't think I ever had as strong of an re- emotional reaction to this book that, that you're having. And, and that may be because the first time I read it, I was not a father yet. And so the, the specific detail of the, the kidnapping of a child and then later the, the, the delivering of the child's organs uh, to the mother is, is not a thing that, spoke to me in any kind of specificity like it would you perhaps i don't know but it just never affected me on that level so i'm really fascinated that it's really getting to you and i do think that that your experience in in listening to the chapters definitely uh played into that yeah i mean frank miller always dramatizes it um to the moon but you know (laughs) i I mean the, the 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 mother discovering her child is dead part was definitely um the the worst like and the thing is i don't know i've always thought it was interesting that we use the word horror to describe this genre i'm Mm -hmm. waving my hands because to me horror is like a very specific emotion which is not just like oh it's spooky like horror is that feeling of something is so awful that you almost can't think about it yeah, and this book is one of the rare books that actually gave me that horror, that feeling of like, I'm just aghast at, at just the, the idea, just imagining what this would be like has disturbed me. Um, yeah. You know? No, I think that's, that's, uh, yeah. I, and I think you have children that are not exactly Tyler's age, but fairly close, yes, right? M- much easier to just kind of automatically imagine the, the yeah. scenario yeah yeah and i think i remember when we were talking about salem's lot and we got to the point of salem's lot where the the uh woman has an infant that is just driving her insane and she hurts and she hurts the infant uh-huh. and i at the time of reading that book had an infant right i think i think my infant was almost the exact same age as her infant at the time mm-hmm. and that really fucked with me so yeah i mean i think there is a level of oh this relates specifically to me um i was watching a, a tv show the other day where a, a woman is killed um and in her house and no one finds her body for the whole entire day and she had like a one-year-old sitting in a crib the entire day and the the show is like torturing you by not telling you if the kid's okay and i was just losing my mind because i was like what about the kid you keep calling the house trying to get a hold of the woman in the room who's dead but what i don't hear a baby crying what about the child and i was just going insane Uh Um, the kid was okay by the way okay you don't even know the show I'm talking about, but I'm just calming your nerves. The kid was fine. I was worried. I mean, her mo- his mother's dead, so he's not like fine, fine. But health-wise, the kid is okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Yeah, no, but I, I mean, I get what you mean. You know, the, the closer you are to it, the more you relate. It is mm-hmm. interesting because there's, so, there's some things that I think never – um, like I think I'll always be disturbed by – you know, the thought of, of bad things happening to little children, even after my kids are older, um, because that's, sure. that's been the case with me now, now that none of my kids are particularly tiny. I, um, I guess the question is, 
did you, did you feel this way before kids? Not particularly. I mean, I, I think as much as a as a healthy normal person doesn't right. want I mean, to watch anyone, children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Anyone but, should have a basic level yeah. of oh no, but but that, not those poor kids. Not the way that I do now. No, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think I think that's right because I feel like you're going to be able to imagine your child at every age that you see a child in in danger at from now on. I think this absolutely and yeah i mean like i i just want to blanket the statement like you don't have to have kids to not to be affected by kids getting hurt that's not what we're saying at all i think it just turns on some circuits that make it way more urgent is all yeah 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 definitely um but i do I, here I, there's something else i want to talk to you about here and i want to talk about the choice that the book made even last week to let us know that Tyler is absolutely going to fall victim to the fisherman here. This is what we were talking about in the intro with the tension here. Um, because the book says this in black and white. And I mean, like the, it, the whole part is called the taking of Tyler Marshall. And it, it's really interesting to me because like, there's a version of this book where you establish the fisherman, you establish Tyler and you establish Bernie and and you could play this entire scene out not knowing whether or not Tyler was going to get away and you could mine a whole lot of tension from that scene and that's not what the book is doing here that's not what King and Strav are doing here they specifically spell it out and even again here in case we forgot right before Tyler gets taken we have this this line here where it says Ty takes another step towards his doom and all the worlds tremble Um, so once again saying he's fucked um, this is what's happening. And and that is not to say that the scene is not tense. And I, and I want to talk about tension here because this is actually something I see over and over again when people talk about reading and they talk about storytelling and they talk about the concept of tension and stakes and, and, uh, and these kind of things. And I just think we don't do a very good job talking about this kind of stuff because the idea I see a lot is that if you know that the person's not going to be okay or going to be okay then there's no then the scene is not tense because you know the outcome already and i just have to say it's like the exact opposite of that actually yeah right i mean yeah the the dynamics the king uses are are never based around the question of you know is this going to happen or not it's Mm -hmm. you know here you know you have this active tension of um of of like okay well we know the kid's gonna take get taken but how's it gonna happen um but but i think on the other side you know there's there's a huge benefit to just telling the reader what to expect which it like so in this specific instance like if i had been reading this with like a hope in my mind of like, well, maybe he's going to get away and then he doesn't get away. Then there's a chance that you just get really like mad at the story. You know, you, you do the proverbial hurl the book away because you're mad at it because there was a, you know, something horrible happened that you just had, you didn't see coming at all and it feels cheap. Mm-hmm. And, and you kind of, you know, you kind of cease to be in the story. You're like, ah, fuck this, you know? Yeah. And that's, and that's like the worst thing that can happen. Like from a storyteller point of view is to have your reader like disconnect because they're mad about what happened like they have to be they have to buy in and just kind of accept that that's what's going to happen and then they're curious to see how it happens and then they can't be mad anymore yeah um that's true and it, this is not necessarily exactly like hitchcock's bomb under the table right i mean mm-hmm. it, it is it is kind of the idea that we know what's coming but we don't actually ex- actually know when it's coming because we also kind of also know when it's coming right like this whole scene plays out in a way where we kind of it's not that we know exactly how it's going to happen, but like as Tyler walks towards a bush, we know, Oh, this is when he's going to get taken. Like there's no, there's no sense of, of tension mind from the fact that we don't exactly know when the bomb is going to go off because we kind of also exactly know when the bomb is going to go off. And yet a scene like that can still be tense. So like, I just, I just think we talk about this so wrong headedly when we talk about tension and stakes and this idea that, um, these kind of things, knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what's going to happen or believing, you know, what's going to happen or not just deflates the tension in a scene because it does not, because everything in this thing is working towards building, 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 building to this one moment where Tyler is grabbed. And it doesn't matter whether we know that that moment is going to happen or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever made this exact metaphor, but like, 
what's more dramatic like going into the doctor's office knowing you're going to get a a a shot imagine you're a kid um, knowing you're (laughs) going to get a shot or having it sprung on you and then getting the shot promptly yeah like obviously i mean i'm pretty sure i spent most of my childhood anxious about future shots yeah (laughs) yeah maybe we're using the wrong words here because i think i think anxiety and dread is actually what we're feeling here because we know it's coming yeah and and so there there is tension like storytelling tension that is created from that anxiety and dread but i mean that is that is what is functioning here and that's what that's what allowing you to know this and ahead of time works and i i love what you said about you can't get mad at the book because the book told you what to expect i think that's so true yeah i mean i think that's that's a you know I'm thinking about George R. R. Martin and how he does things where people's reaction really is to actually get mad at the book. Um, and he, you know, he, he's drawn you into the story to the point where you're going to turn the page. You want to find out what happens after that horrible twist. But, um, but I can't help but think that often the, the, it's almost like the, the, the impact is dulled because you were, you were angry when you should have been, you know, you're angry at George R. R. Martin when you yeah. should have been, ideally like in the story i'm not really criticizing george r martin i think he's a genius but like like i think king avoids ever creating that feeling yeah i wonder that makes me think like what the red wedding itself and i won't go into details just in case someone in pop culture doesn't know what the red wedding is but like how different of a scene would have that have been if we knew if we knew about that plot prior to entering the scene i i do think part of the the function of that scene is you figure it out about halfway through and then they're just powerless to watch it play out. But I wonder how different the scene would have been if we, if we entered it knowing every little bit of it, Uh, it would have been a different kind of tension for sure, but possibly a more effective one. I don't know. We'll we'll never know for sure. It certainly would have been a different one. Yeah. And I mean, it's funny. I have to contradict myself because I, I think I was kind of mad at King for what he did to, to, to Jake and Eddie. Um, So, just letting you know that it's going to happen doesn't necessarily make you okay with it. Did did he say Jake was going to die before he did? Uh, I don't think he did. I actually, think so. I think he 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 gave us he gave us sufficient warning with Eddie, but not really with Jake. And yeah. and I guess, and I guess that's a good point. So I was mad. I was more mad about Jake. <laughs> um, and he didn't warn me about Jake. So. Yeah. Um. All right. So from here, we cut to Ty's friends who have realized that he's fallen behind. And sent one of them back to collect him. And then we move over to Bernie, who steps into a bathroom stall and and like Jack Sawyer and Wolf before him, flips. Well, okay, we don't actually know if he flips, like, but he disappears. He's not in the stall anymore. So we can maybe, right? <laughs> something, yeah, something yeah. along those lines, right? Yeah. Um, where he is actually is in a bush outside of the facility. And that is where he stands and grabs Tyler, yanking him into the bush, leaving his shoe behind and disappearing. And there's only one witness to this whole thing, Matt. It's a bee. The bee. It's a a bumblebee. So, I mean, like we've had fun with this, this constant refrain of bees, but like, is this anything to you or are you just like, I don't know, this is bees. I mean, is it the same bee? Is this a magical bee? I mean, or it's is probably this, not the, the same symbol bee. of a bee. The it's bee is, bee. is the idea of us, the observer. I think we're, we're, we're the bee. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're the, we're the floating point of observation. That's just trundling along through the scene, not, not interacting, um, not neither, neither moving to help nor, nor, nor harm. Um, we should have stung him i mean just imagine if we just stung the fisherman right on his stupid hand i know we could have done everything would have been different yeah (laughs) i don't know uh from here we cut back to the scene that you are talking we're talking about a couple minutes ago that you absolutely dreaded judy marshall waking up from a nap in the snap she was dreaming of both ty and gorg and she wakes up and says to herself gorg means death she says and licks her dry upper lip without realizing it her tongue comes out even farther and on the return swipe the tip licks across her nostrils warm and wet and somehow comforting over there gorg means death over there in the far away um so okay 
First, let's talk about the tongue thing, because the tongue thing is a constant refrain for Judy. It's something we saw from the very beginning, and uh, it's something she does here, and it's something she does a little bit later that Fred Marshall sees and is kind of horrified by. And it is very kind of gross and animalistic. And I think actually another place that we've seen this is Bernie does a very similar thing with his mm-hmm. tongue. Um, what, what do you make of this? Um, I mean, on the on the one level, it's, it's just kind of... Um creepy you know it, it <laughs> sure. it's an effective way of kind of making it seem like this person is lo- losing their mind in a vaguely supernatural creepy way it's basically mild body horror on top of everything else um you know the, while i'm having crazy thoughts like you know we, we have this idea that there's something not quite human that uh um, bernie's in connection with well you know she says that she finds this comforting and you know the uh, do, you know dogs kind of lick their nose don't they Mm -hmm. um so you know maybe she's you know maybe there's something not quite human that she's in connection with in in the territories i mean maybe literally a werewolf like that that's a thing um hard to hard to hard to say actually but you know the ability to the, the idea that you would find licking your nose to be licking your nostrils to be calming i'm like well that that would I, I think that would feel uncomfortable it's it's funny i'm, I'm like I, I tried to do it i'm like nope not even close obviously yeah, I, can't re- I can't reach yeah but like if i could i don't think it would feel comforting i think it would feel um um unpleasant and gross yeah but, who wants a wet nose Ugh. right but like dogs like want to have wet noses right so that's why i kept yeah. thinking about dogs um the other interesting sure. thing about this passage not to switch tracks completely is is you know gorg means death it just reminds me so much of um char yu tree means death the the refrain mm-hmm. from yeah um wizarding glass yeah the other thing i like is so she says over there in the and i think your your brain kind of puts territories in there right uh-huh. like you, you automatically say but but here she calls it the far away and i think that's such an interesting choice because like they could have just said territories here like she's she's summoning this from a dream you know like there's nothing stopping her dream self from saying, Oh, this is the territories. So it, it adds this thing of like, Oh, maybe it's not the territories. Maybe it's somewhere different, or it's just trying to add flavor to this that, Oh, different people call this, this world different things. But like, I feel like they've been winking at us so much with the territories references that like, they could have just put territories here, but they didn't. They yeah, wonder, you know, are they, are they withholding that for some dramatic moment that's going to come later? I don't know. Sure. Could be. Um, and then suddenly, suddenly on Judy's table is a fisherman's creel and in it, a bunch of organs um, and a note from the fisherman saying that these organs belong to Ty, except he's missing one kidney because he ate it. Um, but the question we have to ask ourselves, and I think you kind of already answered this question with your relentless optimism is, do these actually belong to Tyler Marshall? Because like I, the timing of this is suspect a little bit, right? Like obviously these events play out in immediate sequence. We don't know how actual, how much time actually went between Ty's taking and this Creel appearing here. But also when we see the house again, there's no sign of the Creel. It has disappeared. Um, at least Fred doesn't notice it. You think Fred would notice a giant, you know, fisherman's uh, basket sitting on his table that has flies buzzing around it and organs in it. He'd probably notice that he doesn't. Um, so, The book is kind of introducing doubt to this whole thing. Um, But then on the other side, when we see Bernie again, when we see him again in a few minutes, he's like got red all around his lips, which one of the orderlies mistakes for strawberry juice, because they they assume that Bernie got into some of the strawberry fest strawberries a little bit earlier. But I think the book wants us to think, oh, this is blood from him eating Tyler's kidney. And so I, (laughs) I guess the question I have for you, Matt, is what what is this well okay so first i'll just say the scene worked on me as if it were just real like okay i I think i just implicitly assumed that that some time had passed and that she was and that you know he had done his his murdering and horrible things and then and you know then he had left the creel on her on her table and so it it hit me with all of, i like how you just read all the description out in your normal voice as if it wasn't the most horrific thing that we've ever read aloud on this podcast um it, like it, it hit me really hard and then only later 
like for example when the creel is not actually on the table did i think oh maybe that was like some kind of psychic hallucination um premonition there is no evidence that it was ever actually there you know i I think there's no firm evidence that it was ever actually there um so so that makes you think well something something's up right by the way creel is just such a great word isn't it um oh yeah it is oh yeah it was it was around this part by the way that a woman with a stroller tried to pass me on the sidewalk (laughs) while i was walking um and then when when this dark form leapt into my peripheral vision i just about jumped out of my fucking skin (laughs) um so sorry neighbor woman who was pushing a stroller I'm glad this is working on you. Yeah. And in that stroller was a creel with a bunch of organs. <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually see if there was a baby in the stroller. So um, definitely not. Yeah, right. Great. Um, so now we move back with Ebby Wexler, who is getting the story out of, uh, of of TJ about Ty's abandoned bike and shoe that TJ found. I, I Speaking of mundane badness that we saw with Pete Wexler, Ebby's father, I, I love how shitty this kid is. We learn here that they left Ty behind um, and then specifically went back to get him, not because they were worried about him, but because he's got the money and they want to buy more magic cards, which is just <laughs> imagining Stephen King and Peter Straub like <laughs> what do kids trying do? <laughs> to think about what magic cards were. What do kids do in 2001 yeah. or so? Uh, they got those damn magic cards or something. Yeah. I don't um, feel like Ebby Wexler would play magic i don't think yeah that's i mean this is definitely showing their age a little bit Uh here because i don't think any of these kids like the idea it's so hilarious to me that ty one of the reasons ty doesn't like these kids anymore is because they want to still play magic cards and he's really into baseball cards Uh and i'm like okay neither of those things would happen (laughs) in 2001 (laughs) yeah there i don't even know where one would buy baseball cards anymore I don't even know if they print them any. Well, they they must, but like baseball cards have really fallen off. Yeah. Like nobody collects baseball cards anymore. Yeah. yeah. The only people that collect baseball cards are like Gen X or boomers. Um for a while my dad like for a while there they would always release like um the full a, a big set like Tops would have like the the complete collection for a year of all all active players in the MLB and my dad would get one of those every year for years. I don't, I think he stopped, but like he has them for years and years and years used to do that. Um, I don't think people do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, people also don't collect pogs anymore. So (laughs) that would be really funny if they were collecting pogs in 2001. (laughs) That would, that would be pogs was done by then. That was definitely uh, more of an early to mid nineties thing. Yes. It's funny because they mentioned Pokemon cards. And so, Stephen King and Peter Straub definitely knew Pokemon cards were a thing. Uh-huh. I think I would find those a little bit more believable than magic cards. Um, <laughs> Be more believable that he's growing out of Pokemon cards and into magic cards, actually. Sure. Yeah. And- <laughs> Which I, by, by the way, I'm not making fun of magic as a game. I played that game in, in uh, middle school for sure. Um, but I was a nerdy kid <laughs> hanging out with a bunch of nerdy kids. I just don't see someone like Ebby Wexler like getting really into like building a counter spell deck <laughs> yeah that that was i agree that's 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 what i really meant actually is like i, I don't think ebby wexler could play magic um <laughs> what what color would ebby wexler play uh, if he would play probably black because he yeah. thinks it's it's cool and badass yeah, yeah. He, he would build a deck like i built a deck which was like oh man all these cards have really high attack power i'm gonna put them all in my deck and yeah. then not be able to cast anything. Right. And my strategy was always to play red and try to build up to like the biggest fireball spell ever. And then it just gets counterspelled and I die immediately. I always liked green. I I had an elf deck that I really... Yeah. We don't need to talk about magic cards anymore. We don't. The point is, Abby Wexler sucks. Yep. <laughs> um, I, I love this moment where he's faced with the fact that his friend, supposedly, uh, might actually be fish food now. It might have been taken, uh, which we know is the truth. And their their reaction to it, or his reaction to it specifically, is to just say, uh, no, he actually left. We saw him leave. We don't have anything to do with this. It's not like they're not going to go tell anyone. They're not going to go do anything. And it's not – the interesting part about this is like it's not like his inaction specifically is what caused – Tyler to be snatched right like him looking at the situation and then inventing the story that didn't happen isn't what caused Tyler to be kidnapped because the kidnapping has already happened it's just 
cruel though it's just mean it's just selfish yeah it's disgustingly selfish um because they don't know you know if something could still be done for him if if they were to quickly tell someone about it maybe he could be found Mm -hmm. um they've just we kind of know that's not possible because we understand the magic of the situation but you're right that they have no idea they have no idea you know and also you know just just in the simple sense of of just detective work like if, if the detectives can find the evidence faster than they can maybe catch this guy whereas now mm-hmm. you know what basically happens is the shoe sits around for a while and then the cop you know we later find out that the cop basically messes up the evidence in the course of just trying to get it out of people's sight yeah um which is all you know again all because they were were selfish and yeah i mean he broke the chain of custody which means if a defense attorney finds out about that guess what happens case thrown out yeah fisherman goes free we don't know if that's the way the story is going to go but like they definitely want you to be thinking about those things for for sure sure. because the because when they're on the phone the guy's like oh i'm gonna have to destroy this this tape (laughs) and it's like that's that never works great the quality of the of the french landing police department unmatched yeah definitely so from here, we move over to poor Fred Marshall. Uh, we see here he's helping unpack a rototiller he just sold to someone when he gets a call from a neighbor saying that they heard his wife screaming bloody murder in the house. And he, of course, rushes home to see what the matter is. Um, and so now we get this interaction between Fred and his wife. Yeah, this is basically the best and the worst part of the book so far. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think about how few other authors would attempt to do this this way like and by this i mean have the the, this upcoming scene where fred goes home and we just very slowly and like like in a detail-oriented meticulous way go through the whole experience of going into the house finding his wife detailing all of the mess that she's made his internal struggle of like being really concerned about her, but not wanting to accept that anything's wrong with his son. And then later, and then eventually getting more and more agitated about that. Like, wouldn't you expect most, most authors would just sort of gloss kind of either gloss over this, or maybe we just like, we rejoin the characters later after they've, after they've, you know, come to understand what has happened. Yeah. Um, Not these guys though. Not these. I think, I think you're absolutely right. The movie version of this event has Jack interviewing Fred Marshall after he's figured out what happened to his son and we just get to see him as this kind of, you know, broken, cold, like sad man. We don't get to actually be with him to experience this beat by beat and step by step. And I mean, the thing I love about it is we get to see Fred Marshall like desperately rationalize again and again and again and again, like in such a believable way because no one wants to go to the first beat of, Oh, my son has been kidnapped by a serial killer. Yeah. Like we even have that established early on with multiple characters where, you know, they're in this town where, where two children have been taken. One child is mission. Two children have been killed. One child is missing. Um, And everyone knows that there's a threat, but even knowing that there's a threat is removed from, oh, this thing could happen to me. And I think Fred is like the perfect mechanism for exploring the idea of shifting from this thing could never happen to me. Oh, it might be happening to me. Oh, it is happening to me. Oh, my God. It's it's really wonderful, and I think you're right that that not a lot of other authors would would take us on that journey. Yeah, right. Like you kind of imagine the the typical way of doing like a detective story is is like maybe maybe the mother discovers some evidence of the crime, and then she screams, and we like cut to the detective picking up the phone. Yeah, the detective's like, oh no, another one. You know, it's like we we flinch away from the true horror of it. Yeah, and I use that word deliberately. Like like here we're dwelling in the horror this this whole bit is pure horror um it's it's stuff that you just don't even want to consider um and we're just we're just lasering in on it specifically well and and the book has kind of telegraphed judy as being important and mattering to the the magic stuff that's happening here like we know that there's some connection between her and, and burnsides we know that she's dreaming and experiencing things and there's something with judy 
But Fred is just kind of a normal guy <laughs> that has suddenly caught himself up in one of the worst things that a parent could imagine happening. And I, and I love the ways in which he kind of represents the mundane in this. Like, I, I wonder if a different version of the story, you know, doesn't cut Fred out, but just minimizes Fred's role in this whole thing and focuses more on Judy, the one who has the magical connection. Um, and I love that we kind of get to see this from both angles. We already hung out with Judy for a bit. and Now we're going over to Fred. Yeah, well, I, I, the way I think about that is like, I don't even know how you could write the perspective of someone who had just seen what Judy had seen because it would be sort of pure madness from the inside. Mm. And so how do yeah. you even write that? Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I mean, he, he everything about Fred Marshall is grounding us in a, a sensible, boring, predictable world that yeah. is being shattered, right? I love that you use that word sensible, Matt, because that's actually the next thing I wanted to talk about. Because okay. before Fred enters this this world of uh, that this post Judy uh, going crazy world, we get this line here as as Fred is driving home. Fred parks his car, a sensible Ford Explorer, in the driveway and hurries up the steps, already calling his wife's name. This is one of those things, you know, we talk about the difference in writing of like big moments or specific small choices. And the thing I want to talk about here is that small choice to just put in the middle of the sentence, a sensible Ford Explorer. Yeah. It's, it's like we, what we have here is just to, to, to reestablish what is happening in the scene. Fred has just left work in the middle of the day to speed home because he's, ha he's been told his wife who he was already actively worried about tottering on the edge of her sanity appears to have had a full mental break in that frame of mind. What the fuck does his car being a sensible Ford Explorer have to do with any of that? Why did we need this in this specific moment? And, and, and the reason is to me because we are doing work to reestablish and reaffirm the idea that Fred Marshall is a normal guy in a normal life who, who does not, have things like this happen to them. Like this is just a, 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 your average everyday normal American man, family man who doesn't experience things like this. And so we drop this one little almost parenthetical in the middle of the sentence right before his entire world is turned upside down just to refresh and remind ourselves that Fred Marshall is the guy, the kind of guy that gets a Ford Explorer, a sensible car for a sensible man who, who, who lives his life and, and follows the rules and does everything he should and has had success and happiness and everything's good. And we're going to, we're going to totally toss all this way right away. Yeah, yeah, um, I, you're you're totally right. I mean, I think it makes it more easy to kind of empathize with, just because it's yeah, like he's, yeah. yeah, he's 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 like you, you know, he's mm -hmm. he's a, he's living a living a, a a modest life. He's focused on his his family and his goals, and uh, and and now we're gonna shatter all that. Yep. So Fred enters his house and finds Judy in their son's room. She has completely destroyed this entire room, Matt, including ripping all the posters off the wall, especially the the poster of the Irish castle, the one that we were kind of told through Ty's perspective was so, so important. That one, she's gone a little bit beyond that, and she's actually ripped the wallpaper behind that poster off the wall, uh, horribly ripping up her nails and fingers in, in a very disturbing way. Um we, we learn here that she was looking for Tyler behind all these posters. She was looking for where he is, um, but he's gone and she cannot get to where, where he is, which I think kind of reinforces your theory a little bit, right? Yeah. He's not, he's not dead, dead, at least not yet. Right. I mean, some of that language in there does make me feel like he is, he is not dead, that, that he has been taken away. And, um, cause I don't know if, if that weren't the case then, then, but this way if that isn't the case then i feel like the authors are toying with us and making us suspect that it might be that's that's how i'm interpreting it sure sure i, I kind of love fred marshall and i just want to say that here like he comes home he's experiencing this this horrible horrible thing his wife has basically like destroyed a room and gone gone mad and his first reaction to this whole thing is to just like be like hey i i love you <laughs> right yeah. like like he looks at her and he says, but he loves her, has loved her from the first week he knew her helplessly and completely and without the slightest regret ever after. And now love guides him. He sits down next to her on the bed, puts his arm around her and simply 
holds her. He can feel her trembling from the inside out. Her body thrums like a wire. I love you, he says, surprised at his voice. It's amazing that seeming calmness can issue from such a crazy cauldron of confusion and fear. I love you, and everything is going to be all right. And of course, the, the second half of that statement, not true. But uh-huh. just like that is his reaction to this. Like they could have had Fred be, you know, furious at his wife, like pissed off that she destroyed this room, pissed off that she's speaking this way, pissed off. Like he, he, there's a version of this where he is just as worried about Ty as she is. And his reaction to her be her saying that Ty is gone is to push back against that so fiercely that he almost gets violent with her. And, and we do see like he, he walks up to that line, right? Like there's a, there's a point where he almost hits her. And then of course stops himself and is like, no, I would never, I would never do, I would sooner chop this hand off than, than ever place it on her. And it's, he's so grounded in that love to the point where that I really, really like, I like him. And I, and I think we're meant to like him. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, like you said, these, uh, both of these, both of these people have been portrayed for us as being just kind of, you know, among the best, like, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, j- basically, they're you know the two best people who live in this town <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um and and uh, uh so they're like we're especially sad that this has happened to them right mm-hmm. uh there's also this line here that i just wanted to pull out for you it says all of judy's current woes began with insomnia and the insomnia has been the one constant throughout oh uh, <laughs> has, really has she started seeing the colors yet i bet she has i don't know if this is meant to be uh, of course it is a fucking course it is what am i saying it's stephen king we're, what, what, we're definitely gesturing towards the existence of insomnia being a thing connected to power in this world yeah because insom- yeah insomnia came out in 94 just reminding everyone mm-hmm. so yeah it's- but i mean that that poses the question then is this the purpose fucking with her specifically to tune her into a world to help you know stop the bad Yes, yes, that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this next part, Matt, is, is really fascinating to me because Fred Marshall decides that the only way to bring his wife back to reality is to prove to her that Tyler is fine, actually. He's good. And so he sets about trying to figure out a way to make sure he's okay without like scaring everyone to death. Like He can't just call up Ty's friend's parents and be like, hey, I think my son is missing. Have you seen your son? Because they're going to panic and he doesn't want to do that. Um, It's so funny to me because it strikes me as such a 2001 problem because I feel like these days a kid Tyler's age would most likely have a cell phone and he'd just just call him and say, hey, Ty, where are you? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure if in 2001 children would be allowed to go out riding on their bikes at all. Like, I, I think... I mean, nowadays, Ty would just be in his room playing Minecraft. Um, <laughs> I guess in 2001, he'd be in his room playing... Uh, um, magic cards. Magic cards. Uh, playing, Xbox. Uh, uh, Xbox. Uh, Halo. Is Xbox Halo. Out? Is it? I don't know. Uh, 2001. Gotta be. Halo's gotta be out in 2001. I don't know. It doesn't actually matter. Well, anyway. <laughs> anyway. I mean, what's funny is like... I. I kept I kept involuntarily like imagining this happening in like the 60s and and that's that's simply because we read you know um you know uh uh Salem's Lot and then and then um um the one about <laughs> Jesus Christ uh go on uh there's lots of them there's a lot of kids on bikes stories that he writes, right? Yeah, you're probably thinking of Stand By Me. I'm, well, which we didn't read. We watched the movie. No, I'm, I'm thinking of Bobby Garfield. Oh, yeah. It's, it's the Little one Man with in yellow two titles and thus I can't <laughs> find the right title. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, like like I, I just keep picturing this happening in an, in an earlier era when it's supposed to be 2001, which was, as everyone knows, roughly 10 years ago. <laughs> I do. I don't know. Like, I feel like. You're right that the idea of a kid going out a summer morning and then not reporting in again until dinner time is a thing that I think doesn't exist anymore. But I like wonder, I wonder where the drawing line of that is, you know, like when did we, when did we make that shift? And I I don't know for sure because I definitely did that. Like I remember in the early to late nineties, 
we would go out and I would just play outside all day with my friends doing whatever, riding around on bikes, playing sports, doing whatever. And I remember like playing basketball in my friend's driveway and just hearing my mom like scream dinner's ready um, as, as the sun started to set. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. And, I, and I would do that too, but I think it was in the two thousands. Um, why, why, why exactly? Well, I don't know exactly. Um, um, I mean, I think honestly, I, I, I was, I was only halfway joking about, you know, Xbox because like when, uh, the, the games that kids, you know, had in, in the two thousands and, and now are, are, are like, you know, highly refined heroin compared to the video games that you and I had when we were kids. Like we, yeah. like we could actually get bored with video games and then we want to go outside and we want to play with friends. Now it's like why would we want to do that when we could just have our friends come over and play video games or interesting or just play or, or now just play with them on, you know, on the, on the internet. Yeah. I guess my read on the situation was this was something that kids were not allowed to do. And you're kind of posing. This is something they kind of chose not to do anymore. So there's a, so, okay. So my theory is slightly more nuanced, which is just that, um, that a, a, a substantial fraction of kids chose not to do it. And then the parents look outside and they see many fewer children playing outside. And then they say to themselves, I don't want to let my kid be like the only kid playing around outside that that that's unusual. And that makes me a bad parent. And then, and then also there's been this weird shift where like now, now like it used to be, yeah, like you could like, you know, seven year olds, eight year olds could just like get on their bikes and go to the, go to the playground or whatever. Nowadays, you'll get fucking arrested if you let your kid go to the playground by themselves at, <laughs> at that age. Like, like, like literally. So yeah, it's so weird that um, happened. It feels like it happened so quickly and not that long ago. Yeah. yeah. So that's that. like, I, I don't know what pushed that change, but that's na- now, now it's like locked in. Like I, mm-hmm. I couldn't just let my kids go like, like legally. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Fred reasons that Tyler will absolutely be back by 4 p.m. No problem. So, so there's no reason to worry anyone really. So he he instead decides to clean up at ho- his house, clean up what his wife did, and then uh, and then he takes a nap. Um, a nap just takes a little nappy. <laughs> uh, what, what do you make of this moment, Matt? Where he is cleaning up Tyler's room, sees the the wallpaper spot on the wall, and says, "No, can't have that," and pushes the big mahogany dresser over that spot in the wall, hiding that spot um what's the significance of what's going to be the door oh okay it's where they get in to the territories okay. i mean it definitely seems important like it seems like he is subliminally aware that this picture was kind of important in some way yeah w- whether yeah. he whether it is magical or not like he knows it means something and maybe jack will know that it means something if, if jack comes and looks at the crime scene mm-hmm. yeah no i agree cool well we'll see yeah uh, so we end this chapter with Fred laying down next to his wife and and uh, falls asleep. And, and we hear her sp- talk in her sleep again. She begins to whisper, Gorg, Abla, the Crimson King, and a woman's name. The name is Sophie. And I just want to state here, for the record, this is a name we do not know, we do not recognize. It has not been anywhere in this book before. Yeah, I don't recognize it from any, any Stephen King stories, actually. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, re- we'll recognize it from these next two chapters, though. All right. So we move into chapter six, which has us back with our wonderful French Landing Police Department. A call comes in from an officer who found Tyler's bike and shoe. And like you said, Matt, he breaks the chain of custody and he 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 puts the shoe in an evidence bag. So good <laughs> job on you. But uh-huh. um, but he throws the bike in the back of his car because he doesn't want to just leave it there because then other people will see it and know that another kid was kidnapped. And I I think this is really interesting because it's not that the French landing police department is stupid, right? Yeah. They're just outmatched there. It's just not, this is not a place where this kind of things happens. And so they don't know what to do. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer for like, oh, that idiot. Here's what he should have done. Like, yeah. he's not wrong to want to keep people from panicking. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, there probably is some procedural correct answer, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. It's also interesting because like this is a th- this chapter itself. We're going to move into chapter seven here pretty quickly because this is a short chapter. But this is a chapter because it's it's another one where not much happens. It's just a lot of table setting for the future. Tyler has been taken. But this chapter is really 
just some people learning about it. And and it's also like a brief stint back in the police department to kind of reinforce the idea that, hey, they don't even have a suspect yet. Like there there, there has been, from what we can see, zero progress made on this case. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I like the checking in with people thing. Uh, as much as yeah. I dislike the floatiness of the first chapter, I really like the effect here of just checking in with different characters and seeing how they react. Mm-hmm. So we then move back to Maxton's as our good friend Henry Layden arrives for his Strawberry Fest DJ session. Uh, They briefly talk about how Pete saw some cops out front and reasoned they were looking for another kid. Um, I I just want to put nothing here to really say yet, except for this right here. No, Henry says soberly. That hardly seems likely, does it? But I guess the cops got to dot all the T's and cross all the I's. He pauses. That's just a a little joke of mine. (laughs) Oh, oh Pete. Pete. <laughs> uh, we're now back with Fred Marshall, Matt, and, and we see here that at the beginning of this section, he's having a horrible dream where he is fishing with his wife, Judy, and they catch a were trout, which is a fish with Tyler's face on it. Um, is this prophetic, Matt, or is this just, you know, the the mind fucking with you, the mundane mind just fucking with people? Uh, nothing mundane in these books. It's totally <laughs> prophecy. You know, it sure. also reminds me of young Ralph Roberts catching a pregnant catfish. Um, yeah, so and, many insomnia references here. And that being kind of a horrible moment. Um, yeah. So Fred wakes up to Judy choking to death, uh, having stuffed wads and wads of paper almost all the way down her throat. He saves her, performing the Heimlich maneuver, and checks the sheets that she was trying to eat. And on them, we see a bunch of nonsense words that obviously mean a great deal more to you and I than they do to Fred himself. We see it's covered with tangles of scribbled words, Gorg, Abla, Elili, Munchen, Baz, Lum, Apopanax, these mean nothing to him. Others, drudge, asswipe, black, red, Chicago, and tie are actual words but have no context. Printed on one side of a sheet is, if you've got a Prince Albert in a can, how can you ever get him out? Upon the other, like a teletype stuck in repeat mode, is this. Black house, Crimson King, black house, Crimson King, black. Okay, so I I think we've seen a lot of these words before, but I think the Apopanax is probably the one that we're most interested in here, right? Because like we said, it's already been established that Judy and Bernie are connected in some way. They've both had said Gorg. They both said Abela. We don't know what these things mean yet, but we know that they both said them before. And so that's connecting them in some weird way. But this one is connecting us directly with Jack Sawyer, right? Um, the, the, the Opopanax spelling word that we saw in Jack's chapter last week. Um, yeah. Yeah. Getting some, so uh... this is something else. Some coincidences being thrown up by the universe. Yeah, and and this is another... Okay, so I have to cry everyone's pardon here because I have to point something out that I completely missed last last week that several of our listeners reached out and pointed out to us. Uh, Just So just thank you to all those listeners who emailed and messaged about the Apopanax feather because, Matt, I totally forgot that this is a word that we've heard in the Dark Tower before. So there was a feather that was used in Calibrin Sturgis to control who could and couldn't speak during a town meeting. This is basically their version of the conch from Lord of the Flies, and it was called an Apopanax feather. Uh, And so we don't know what that means, (laughs) really, but it is a reference, and and we do have to point that out. So I've forgotten the face of my father. I, I cry your pardon, listeners. It was I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that I did not catch this. I don't think you need to be sent west um, this time. <laughs> the 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 thing with the the connecting of it to feathers though is interesting because Jack keeps seeing all these all these red feathers, which I, I mean he he says are, are robin feathers, but who knows, man? It's yeah, magic. maybe it's an apopanax. Whatever, it's an apopanax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we see here that it's 417 and Tyler is still not home. So Fred is officially freaking out enough to call the police and report his son missing. And we see here that Officer Bobby Dulac manages to put some things together and asks Fred if his son has a, a Schwinn bike. And just like we were talking about before, Matt, I, I, I love this because it shows again that the PD office here isn't stupid just inexperienced like like officer Dulac actually making that connection saying oh we have a missing child and didn't one of our officers just note that there was an abandoned bike somewhere like the idea that he made this connection that's like good police work right but then the idea that he tells that to Fred and doesn't keep that to himself and use that information to actually investigate before telling the possible victim's father is what makes him naive and I think what I'm saying here really is they really need Jack 
They really need Jack. Yeah, they do. They definitely do. But yeah, I mean, now that we were, now that we wrapped up this chapter, you know, Fred's mental state throughout all of this and, and then culminating here is just excruciating to read. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I wanted to mention without, you know, naming names that uh, a few months ago we read a different book by a different author where, you know, a mother discovers her child's dead body in that book. And I could tell, frankly, that there was no way that that author had children um, from the writing because, you know, the mother didn't go immediately insane, <laughs> um, which is the only sort of realistic thing that could happen here. And, and and Fred here, he hasn't gone immediately insane, but that's because he hasn't realized, you know, he's he's sort of going insane with terror. Right. And, and I think when his terror breaks into understanding, then then that will be. Uh, a nightmare for him as well. Um, but this is, you know, like, uh, like I was saying earlier, this is the, the honest and, and horrifying, um, um, honesty, eh, like, like, like directly looking at this thing that nobody ever wants to think about. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. It, it's hard to imagine, like I have kids and it's still hard for me to imagine like what my reaction would be to being told this. I, I don't I don't know yeah. it's, it's but I think this book does a really good job of of capturing something I, I find I think you're right that I find it just absolutely heartbreaking just watching this woman go through this now I mean I think I would go into a state of complete panic and denial and um I would not be useful in any way to anyone I would I would be a complete liability and mm-hmm. and like and beyond that i can't really extrapolate sure sure all right but fortunately matt we get to leave that behind we don't have to deal with that anymore we move on to happier times in in magic lucky chapter number seven yay Uh, so this is a chapter that takes place entirely in the maxton elder care facility it's fascinating because like we said so much of this book has been ugly and disturbing and and it's not that this chapter doesn't include those ugly and disturbing things. Like it has Charles Burnside in it, of course. But the majority of this chapter is really just describing how fucking awesome Henry Layton is, right? Including the opening sentences of this chapter as it just describes this incredible zoot suit that he's wearing. This incredible, badass, shiny, wonderful suit that is like hypnotizing. Uh, it's just it kind of the book recognizing we need a little break here. Yeah, I mean Henry Henry Layden is definitely a whole different type of character than what I've seen in any King or Straub novel. He's um he's cool. And in that in the specific use of the word cool that has become kind of lost because we've overloaded the world with the word cool, where now cool means yeah. like like, you know, Roland is cool, but but not but not like we use the word roll r- cool for Roland because it's like, well, he's a stone cold killer, you know, but that's not what the word originally meant. The word originally meant this ineffable quality of, of just like knowing the right thing to say, just being impeccably, you know, turned out and just, and just being awesome. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of cool that Henry Layden is. Hell yeah. He, you're so right here. And I love him so much. He's such a great character. Um, like this is, this is the thing you love about King, because I think you went into this book kind of probably figuring that you'd see Jack again. Right. And, and maybe mentally prepared to either see a version of Jack that you recognized or perhaps a version of Jack that you did not recognize. But then here comes this character who is just totally unlike anything you would expect. And yet he just feels completely at home within this world. Yeah, exactly. I really love this moment where Pete says to him, guess you never heard of CDs when he's carting around Henry's vinyl. It's especially funny to me because there's a line in the last chapter where uh, Pete Wexler is looking at all these uh, vinyl records and is saying it to himself in his own head. This guy probably didn't even know what CDs are. So I like to think that it's been like 45 minutes and he's still like mulling over this great quip that he had. And then he finally decides to say it. And Pete or er, er, Henry is just like, actually, I have 9000 CDs, dummy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except he except he does it in a way that makes Pete not feel like an idiot, which is right. Because yeah. that's the that that's the yeah. fascinating thing about the scene, right? 
yeah, he's that's that's what makes him cool. Is he yeah. is is you put a you put a cool person in a in a bad situation, and somehow they came they come out of it looking better. Yeah, that's the definition of cool in my opinion. Right, because th- there's this really interesting part where like um, uh, Rebecca asks Henry where he got the suit, and Pete mumbles to himself. Um, that that oh he probably was chasing after a, a black person he doesn't use that word by the way he uses a much worse word that uh-huh. he won't say um and then moments later henry says the word that pete was muttering to himself and saying he'd be proud to own the clothes of such a person um and it they are both so off put because by the way henry says says the word um which is a little shocking um and it kind of completely disarms everyone. And it's just this really fascinating thing because he is kind of making fun of Pete here and, and specifically throwing back his muttering against him. But you're right. He does it in a way in which Pete likes him by the end of this conversation, he warms up to him. And it's just this really fascinating thing. If, if I will admit like a a clunky, race thing that i don't think works i i really think king and straub mean well here i think it's just a little bit clunky how they handle like i don't know it's just a little weird to me yeah i think i think just the way that they think about that word is not the way that we think about that word <laughs> that's true, true. Um, and and it's funny it's funny now because it's like this was in 2000 which is like at this inflection point where um I don't know. I think I think the way people thought about these things was changing pretty pretty rapidly. But yeah, yeah like I I, I don't think certainly in this day and age, like even even in a way to like obviously bad terrible people use the word all the time, right? Um, mm-hmm. and and use it in exactly the way they mean to use it, which is to be dismissive and mean and and racist. Um, the the book is trying to make Henry using it here be like this moment of. I acknowledge the terrible thing that you said, and I'm trying to use that word that you that actually I don't think I don't think Henry or Pete actually uses the N word. I think he says it would be that thing. You probably have to chase after uh, a person who belongs to a race that would start with the letter N. I don't think he actually uses the word. I think he's just thinking the word because he's probably a racist asshole. And then Pete or Henry goes full bore by actually saying the word out loud to kind of disarm it in a way. And like, God, they mean so well, yeah. but yes, I just well, don't think, I don't think that, I don't think that works. I mean, in what they're trying to like, do here. like, like strategically, if we pretend that these are real people, then that's the kind of, what he's doing is he's, he's standing up for, <laughs> for black people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. But, but, but in a way that, that that kind of in a way that i think any black person would go please don't yeah right (laughs) please please don't yeah it's um it's uh, what it's it's funny how it how hard it is to kind of verbally nail down why this this scene why this moment works even though it's sort of clunky um, yeah clunky yeah yeah but yeah i mean i I think i think the point here in in the story itself awkward stephen king ray stuff aside is that Henry is this like ineffable cool that you just mentioned. And even in this moment of awkwardness where, where Pete is this racist asshole, he manages to both insult him and disarm him in the same blow, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we also, in this moment, speaking of people that aren't that good, we, we see Rebecca Villas. Does the book say Villas or, or Vias? Because two L's would be I Vias, mean, but think, there's not two L's. I think Vilas actually. Vilas. Okay. Yeah. I guess that I guess that's the way. Yeah. Rebecca Vilas gets informed by Pete that the kid that a kid potentially vanished from out front of their establishment earlier today. And and God, these people suck, Matt, because uh-huh. because Rebecca takes it all in. And here's what she says. She says, OK, but that's not like our fault, right? Like no one here did that, which is not true. But but like it happened outside, not in here. So we don't have to deal with that problem. And. <laughs> And here, what she says after she says that out loud, she looks at at Henry and says, sorry, I know that sounded awfully cold. I'm as distressed about this fisherman business as everyone else. What with those two poor kids and the missing girl? We're all so upset we can hardly think straight. But I'd hate to see us dragged into this mess. Don't you see? 
I see perfectly, Henry says, being one of those blind men George Wraithburn is always yelling about. It's great. Um, it's great because he's <laughs> he's insulting her. Uh-huh. Like this is this is the coolness of fucking Henry in that he is George Wraithburn. Yeah. <laughs> like he is that person. He is him. And so like I I see perfectly as like I see exactly who you are, right? I, I I see exactly who you are. I know exactly what you mean and I know exactly what you do, which is that you don't actually care or you care to a certain level but not beyond that. And what you're really worried about is yourself. Yeah. More selfishness. Yeah, I mean he's kind of saying like you're you're transparent, but but again in a way where no one feels offended. Yeah. Yeah. Because you could read that as like, yeah, no, I understand. I know what you mean. I get it. Yeah. I mean, the the I didn't I didn't even get the vibe that he's being condescending, even though I think in his head he's probably being sardonic, you know. Oh, I think he absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. So Pete finally has probably the only good idea he's ever had in his entire life here, Matt. He says Jack Sawyer should join the case. And Henry, of course, agrees, which we already knew. Um, and and by the way, so do we. We agree, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're 163 pages into this fucking book, and Jack Sawyer still has not stopped refusing the call. In fact, he's refusing the call so much that he's not in this week's reading at all. We uh-huh. don't see Jack one bit. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I was actually kind of I was joking there a little bit, but I, I do have this serious question for you. D- do you have a problem with the pace of this book so far? Is this working for you here? You know, um, it doesn't really bother me that that it's taking a while for Jack to get pulled in. It just makes it seem – I think it just makes his hesitancy seem more credible. Like that's that's the – we talked about this in the last book too actually. Like like the, the dramatic purpose of the refusal of the call is to make it really clear that – the character really has strong reasons for not wanting to get involved in this thing because like it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be bad for them in some way, or it's scary for them or it's, it's upsetting for them. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, there, there's always a tension there. A lot of, a lot of stories rush through the refusal because it's a plot point we have to hit, but then you don't buy that the character is actually doing something that makes them feel really, really out of their comfort zone. So sure. here I really buy that Jack really doesn't want to do this. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And and yet the book is is doing work to make it so transparently clear that the the book it, the story needs him to do it. Like like the, like I think you're so right that the we're refusing the call is bad is a when there's no real narrative reason to do it and we're just kind of doing it because that's what the the hero's journey says. And then B when it it's not exactly clear exactly the ways in which the people calling upon the hero need him other than some nebulous like bad is happening yeah but i think i think this book has done the work to establish both of those things really really well yeah i think you're right so moving on we now watch as henry layton becomes symphonic stan like like almost literally transforms into another person and it's this incredible magical moment where he he through his music breathes life into this old folks home. People that haven't moved in years are dancing and laughing and having fun. And it, 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 once again, in the middle of this dark, dark, very mean book, it's this nice refreshing moment of like, Oh, this is what a good person can do to the people around him. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. We still don't understand why, um, you know, why he is this way, <laughs> but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it broadly. Um, but yeah, it's a really beautiful bit. It, it reminds me um, of, of how King often portrays the elderly as being sort of angelic and elevated, uh, which is an interesting contrast because for most of this book, we've been focusing on the elderly being miserable and lonely and how their bodies are falling apart. Yeah. Um, but here, they, it's almost like they transform into the sort of, you know, the sort of more fleshed out, characterized elderly that we met in Insomnia. Sure, sure. I, I, I like that. And yeah, I mean, there is something important to what, henry's doing here right Mm -hmm. we we don't know why but just just once again to establish himself as like he takes this thing seriously everyone that works in this place is uninterested in these people um we didn't talk about it but there's like this this beautifully written part where before the concert itself uh families are meeting with the old folks outside and and like they're all eating together and and that's the part of the strawberry fest in which um families actually get to hang out with the 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 old folks and 
there's this really interesting thing where Maxton himself both asks for donations because he's a fucking terrible miser. And we'll get back to that shortly. But we see that the place clears out really, really quickly because people don't want to spend a time in this place. Like as soon as they have an excuse to leave, they're going to leave. They don't want to spend time in this place. These are their loved ones, right? Their family, their parents. And they, as soon as the event's over, they get the fuck out of there very, very quickly. And so like everyone treats these people as if they're disposable, unnecessary, uh, or, or just dollar signs, uh, on, on a bottom line. And the only person to see them as people, people that deserve to have fun and be entertained and and deserve to capture some of what what living is, is Stefanik Stan, is is Henry Layton. And again, that just reinforces his essential goodness as a person. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I am. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm so curious about this character. He's like my favorite character right now. Yeah, I, I want to talk to you again about we kind of touched on this last week, but I'm wondering if your opinion has changed at all here. I, I want to talk about what the book describes in these passages as Henry's, quote, uniquely malleable personality. Right. Mm. Th- this idea that he can so easily become these people and not just impersonate. But th- the way the book describes it is when he's George Rathbun, he's he's fully him. Right. When he's. Um, symphonic Stan, he is fully committed. He is transformed almost to this person. When he's uh, the rat, he's fully that person. Um, in a way that the book almost describes it as magic. Like the, the, the real magic here is not the music. The real magic here is Symphonic Stan and how Henry has become this person. And we talked about this a bit last week, but I mean, what do you think about this now? Can we relate this to our Twitter idea and the talisman to this this duality concept we've been talking about? How does this tie into that? Yeah, I, you know, I, th- I think I said this last week, like it's not a his character is not so much about duality, but rather multiplicity where there is an intentional lack of, of polarity. Like it's not like there's a good and a bad. There's there's a bunch of different things that are all kind of random and, and he can go in any, any direction. He can be anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the most I can nail it down is to say like, you know, if, if most people are dual natured and Jack Sawyer is specifically single natured, then maybe Henry is, is, is no, no natured. Maybe he's null natured and he has no innate nature and he can go any direction or, or maybe he's all natured. Maybe he's, he's, um, undefined, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it, it, Something, you know, I, I do think that we're doing something with him, though. There's going to be something, something territories and magical related with him where it's not, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's tied into the, to the magic. Sure. Yeah. Um, of course, into this beautiful, serene, wonderful scene comes Bernie to fuck it all up. Um, when he hears that Stan is taking requests, he first asks him for a song called Lady McGowan's Nightmare. Of course, the name of the song is actually Lady McGowan's Dream. But, but Bernie's an asshole, so he says that. Um, and then when he learns that Henry doesn't have that record, he requests, I can't get started, which we'll learn later is Henry's late wife's favorite record. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that was just a coincidence, right, Matt? Right? No. <laughs> I love I love the <laughs> certainty with which you say that. Yeah. Uh, Bernie <laughs> sucks. He's fucking asshole. Right. I mean... The qu- the real question is like does you know does he know this magically or or does he have some actual knowledge from his normal life I, I think probably just magic I yeah we'll see. yeah uh, Rebecca Vilas is is made uncomfortable by, by this whole thing and the magic of the moment is kind of ruined for her so she walks out and bumps into Bernie again and confronts him for a shitty behavior to everyone. And then Bernie starts speaking nonsense and we see some more words here, Matt. Uh, we see Lady McGowan had a bad, a bad nightmare. Bernie informs her he sounds drugged or half asleep. And Lady Sophie had a nightmare. Only hers was worse. He giggles. The king was in his counting house, counting out his honeys. That's what Sophie saw when she fell asleep. His giggling rises in pitch and he says something that might be Mr. Munching. His lips flap, revealing yellow, irregular teeth, and his sunken face undergoes a subtle change. A new kind of intelligence seems to sharpen his features. Does you know Mr. Munchin? Mr. Munchin and his little friend Gorg? Does you know what happened in Chicago? <laughs> so, uh, Matt, there's there's the name Sophie. We, we heard that last chapter with Judy, and here we have it with Bernie again. So who's Lady Sophie? Any idea? Um somebody in the territories maybe um sure somebody's twinner who who's i don't know maybe judy's 
well, I, I don't know. I, there, there's a lot of intentional chaos and, and just, just gobb- gobbledygook names. It's funny. I feel like the names are, are more um, intentionally nonsensical in this book. Uh, like uh, there's something about like Gorg and Munchen and, and Abala. Um, these all just sound like silly kind of childish made up words as opposed to, you know, the more kind of, you know, dignified and, and, and carefully constructed fantasy words that you might hear in some other novel. You know what I mean at all? You, you feel me here? Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. I, you know, King waffles back and forth. Though. Like I think the more King, you read the more nonsense words you're going to encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he just makes up a lot of nonsense words that the bad guys say. So I think this is, this is right at home in Stephen King okay. to me. Okay. Um, you've seen a specific dark tower variety of it, which is not necessarily nonsense words, but just like different fantasy kind of sayings. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is classic King to me. Um, he also says a name Fritz Harmon and, and a place Hanover. And these are things that, that uh, Rebecca writes down, but again, is just, okay. We, we, clues, I guess, uh-huh. you know, we, yeah. we have nothing to do with this. We don't know where to put it, but the book made sure we know that Rebecca writes it down. So it seems like this is going to matter in some way. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but Rebecca leaves Bernie and then goes to hang out with her boss, Mr. Maxton, who just a stand up individual, Matt. I, I, I love this line, though. Hey, hey, cheer up. You won't believe how much your silver tongued boyfriend conned out of the relatives today. A hundred and twenty six smackers free money. <laughs> now, I don't want to make it seem like one hundred and twenty six bucks is not a, a fair amount of money. It, it certainly is. But like. What the fuck? Like. It's nothing uh-huh. in the grand scheme of things. It just shows how fucking miserly and terrible he is that he's just going to pocket 126 bucks from these poor people that are already paying for care that their their loved ones are not getting. Yeah. Here. He's just a piece of shit. He is. It's the worst. I mean, I, I, specifically, he gives this pitch where he's like, you know, this is to this is to supplement the care of your loved ones. And he's just like, mm-hmm. ah, this is mine now. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a wonderful way to remind ourselves of how fucking terrible this guy is. Um, And I think Rebecca knows it on some level, right? The the chapter actually ends with her saying, hey, it's kind of weird that Bernie is more interested in the fisherman than my boyfriend is, right? He doesn't seem like he gives a shit. In fact, the only thing he said about him is I'm not going to be able to tell people that I'm going fishing until they catch this guy, which is a crappy deal. Uh Uh-huh. What an asshole. <laughs> yeah. No, this uh, bunch of people in this book suck quite a lot. And it's yes, yes, yes. Can't yes. wait to see terrible things happen to them. Yeah. Well, maybe we will see. But that is going to do it for us this week. Um, that is the end of the chapter. Next week, we will be covering three more chapters. Um, chapters eight, nine and ten as we continue to work our way into the novel. Oh, man, I can't wait, Matt. It's going to get more and more interesting. Um, y- you ain't seen nothing yet. As well. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Excellent. (laughs) All right. So let's move into our discussion question. Last week's question was what, Matt? Who's your favorite point of view character that feels like they're losing their mind, but they might not be. All right. And we got a lot of great answers on this one, too. Let's get into it. So Quirky Bean says, I can't decide on a favorite. Honorable mention goes to Jake Chambers, Jack Torrance, uh, Miller from the Expanse books, John Locke, and book Cersei Lannister. Sorry, Cersei Lannister. So I'm going to change the word favorite to the word relatable. And with that being said, my answer is Lewis uh, Lewis Creed from Pet Cemetery. I won't say much because spoilers, but man, I was right there with him the whole time. Oh boy, Matt, uh, Pet Cemetery, a book that we got several recommendations for for any potential season three. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we can do that. I, I think. Here's what I think. We're, here's uh, here, the plan of attack here, Matt. I think on a, a upcoming other levels of the tower, I'm going to have you watch the original Pet Cemetery movie, and we're going to talk about it. And then based on how you react to the movie is going to decide whether or not we're going to spend time talking about that book. Because I really feel like this is one of those books that living in it for two months is just a bad plan. And well, just for our mental health. As long as nothing bad happens to children in the book, Scott, I think we're fine. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Pet Cemetery, first book of season three. 
Got nothing to worry about. Uh, oh boy. Um, next we have baby. Can you dig your sand says the trick here is that they might be insane or might not. Right. There are lots of stories about ascent into madness. There's also plenty of times where the other characters in the story believe the protagonist is insane, even though we, the audience know that they're not, but characters who believe that they might be going crazy. That's slightly different. A few that comes to mind are Jennifer Lawrence in mother Mia Farrow and Rosemary's baby and James Cole and Terry Gilliam's 12 monkeys in 12 monkeys james cole is a puppet with very little information sent on a time traveling mission and the brilliance of the film is that throughout the movie the protagonist the people around him and the audience are increasingly unsure as to whether or not he's insane and aside as we sit here in the midst of a global pandemic that's claimed close to two million people wow has it really been two million Jesus. A time when authoritarian regimes are gaining strength around the world and climate change is happening at unprecedented levels, 12 Monkeys is feeling quite prescient. Time travelers James Cole and Sarah Connor scream, you're already dead to anyone who will listen, and it falls on deaf deaf ears. Oh, man. Uh, 12 Monkeys. One of our favorite movies, yeah. right, Matt? Yeah, one of, for sure. Um, somehow still underrated. If you haven't seen 12 Monkeys, go see 12 Monkeys immediately. It's so fucking good. It's I so good. Movie. It's amazing. Yep. And that's a great example, I think, as well. Um, that's that's like the perfect example because the character and you are are intentionally kept like right on the knife's edge of like actually not just thinking he's crazy, but wanting him to be crazy mm-hmm. because that's better than the alternative. Yep. Yep. All 84001 says, although it gets unfairly maligned nowadays due to the Fincher movie adaptation being co-opted by incels, the alt-right, and just about every obnoxious college dude bro you've ever met met alike, the original novel Fight Club remains a seminal treatise against the pitfalls of toxic masculinity and capitalism, as well as an example of a narrator who may or may not be going completely insane. It's a shame that its legacy is tainted by a bunch of meatheads and neckbeards who completely <laughs> miss the satire, assuming that Tyler Durden is meant to be some kind of hypermasculine ubermensch template for them to idolize. One of the oft-overlooked points in Fight Club is that patriarchy hurts everyone, including men. Tyler is a cancerous alter ego that the narrator needs to exorcise, eventually, uh, which he eventually does by shooting himself in the face, of course. The twist reveal that he's been a figment of the narrator's imagination the whole time is still one of the best wait what total shock oh, sp- moments spoilers fuck Spoil- oh man shoot <laughs> uh unlike the film in the end of the book the narrator describes meeting god seated behind a desk with diplomas on the wall behind him taking notes on a little pad does that sound more like a psychiatrist in an institution so even after reconciling his dual personalities it's still not clear just how bonkers the narrator really is tossing the whole novel into question did, did any of it really happen if you can get around the fact that its message of a broken American dream became a rallying cry for the worst of modern men, Fight Club is definitely a book that demands a second read. Um, yeah, I, I've the, never read Fight Club. Have you? Yeah, it's way darker. Um, sure. Than the, the like, like you know how the movie. I'm just giving this as an example because it's not really a spoiler if you watch the movie. But like you know how in the movie they like threaten to take guys' balls. They just actually do they it. They just actually do it, and then they blackmail them with like, "We'll let people know that we did this." nice um which is you know wait it's it's dark in a way that's almost like unrealistic because you're like that wouldn't really work that way but <laughs> but, but, but it does go it does go into the 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 examination of masculinity though because yeah. like what is worse than losing your balls it's other people knowing that you've lost your balls that's, that, that, that's exactly it like it, it works so much better on, on, on a literary level because it's yeah. like it's 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 literally just like yeah they'll do whatever you tell them now because they they can't bear for other people to find out that they've been emasculated which is yeah. the worst thing ever which is the whole thesis of the yeah god um nothing quite shows how much you've grown up than watching fight club in your 30s <laughs> you yeah. know uh i i adore that movie we we did a whole fincher series on our other podcast and uh fell in love with that movie and, and yeah i i I I wrestled with it for years about like whether or not I thought that the movie was truly tainted by the dumbest people getting the worst possible reading out of it. But I just don't care anymore. The movie is wonderful and perfect and very, very clear in what it's doing and exploring. And I don't care that dumb people don't understand its meaning. Yeah. I mean, I I want want to I want to say this carefully and I'm probably not going to say it quite right, but like. (laughs) Like d- dumb people are also struggling. And so sure. it's not that shocking that a movie that's about the plight of of struggling, suffering men would speak to a bunch of struggling, suffering men. Um, it yeah. just so happens that they took it in a way that 
made them feel like it was justifying negative impulses of sure. theirs. And I would hope that as those men continue to age and re- revisit the movie, they will realize what it is very, very clearly doing. Yeah, I think so. I hope so anyway. Yeah. Um, next, we have a, a new question answer who I swear to God made this Reddit account name just to hear me read it out loud because we have boner six, 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 four twenty. Um, and they answer a uh, long time listener finally caught up enough to answer. And mine is Colonel Jack O'Neill from Stargate SG one in the classic time loop episode window of opportunity. Jack and Teal are the only poor bastards on the base who eventually realize that they're experiencing the same 12 hours or so for at least six months. What starts with the pair thinking they're losing their minds ends with them throwing protocol to the wind and using the Stargate as a driving range to launch a golf ball. A record-breaking several million light years, and my heart goes out to poor Teal'c, whose loop started at the exact moment he gets hit in the face by a carelessly opened door. <laughs> I loved Stargate SG One. I never finished it, but man, that was a good show. Really, I, I never, I didn't know that you watched that, and I never watched. My it. dad was super into it, so I huh. watched it with him. Cool. And he, I, I just, I just love, I just love Kratos actor. So it makes me happy. <laughs> Kratos actor, yeah. Cool. Um, I, I don't know anything about that, but but cool. Uh, Pear Jane says, my first thought was Pauline from Peter Jackson's Brilliant Heavenly Creatures. This gorgeous, based on a true story movie, introduces two brilliant young actors, Melanie uh, Linsky and Kate Winslet, in performances that rival that of any experienced actor. Melanie Linsky's Paul is moody, sullen, creative, and basks in the reflected sunlight of Kate Winslet's stunning Juliet. Their uh, friendship consumes their lives and their wild fantasies are sexy, violent, and hilarious as any imaginative 14-year-old ought to be. But as Juliet seems to be blithely engaging in the fantasies as, as an elaborate game of pretend, Pauline sinks deeper, convincing herself and Juliet that Paul's mother stands between them and the fantasy they've constructed. Given the conclusion of the story, the girl's I don't know if we want to spoil everything about this movie, actually, because I haven't seen yeah. this movie. So I'm yeah, going to stop there because I haven't yeah. actually seen this. And I actually love Peter Jackson. I love I love weird early Peter Jackson. So I'm going to go Me ahead and, and stop this and then just say, I'm going to watch this movie. Yeah. So the, the heartbreaking thing here is that Pear Jane is one of our, our patrons um, and, and is one of our patrons that is responsible for nominating movies for our, our monthly canon episodes. And and she has been desperately and unsuccessfully trying to get people to vote on this movie so we could watch it and do a canon episode on it. And it just hasn't won yet. And I haven't seen it either. And I really want to. And I really want to do an episode on it. So uh, if you are a patron of ours, next time our canon vote comes up uh, next month, Maybe uh maybe give it a vote so we can we can cover this movie. Yeah, because we don't watch things that you don't vote for. That's true. I how this that's content, Matt. Like, yeah. I was gonna go see Doctor Strange, and I was like, "Ooh, do we have a Doctor Strange episode on the schedule?" No. Well, no. then can't can't do can't that. Watch it. Yep. <laughs> Too bad. Um, Fellow Dow says, I think Edgar Allan Poe is still the literary master of characters whom you can tell aren't quite right in the head, but whose exact degree of craziness is hard to pin down. The lurid gothic style of his writing only contributes to the off kilter fever dream atmosphere of his psychological horror tales. The black cat, the telltale heart, the cask of Amontillado and the fall of the house of Usher are ones that stand out in my memory. Heck, even Poe's poetry is often narrated by hysterical paranoids of questionable mental soundness. For a soon-to-be-relevant example, see his poem, The Raven. Excellent. Um, you are you are correct, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this yeah, is the, the correct answer. I mean, it's kind of the archetype of this of this idea yeah. in, in some yeah. ways. Yeah. I, I love Poe so much. Yeah, me too. It's it really, I mean, I think the amazing thing about Poe is he can capture this feeling that we're all kind of talking about in in relatively few words, like mm-hmm. like like, you know, the Raven, for example. Yep. All right. Uh, Kids Kitchen says, for me, Lisey's story is a terrifying mix of the supernatural, grief, and embracing madness as a way to remain close to a loved one. Lisey wallows in old memories and the dusty remnants of a, of a shared life while giving in to former addictions like smoking and eating nasty. I see her looking for comfort in self-destruction and compulsive thinking, and I think I would do the same. The story makes it easy to imagine exchanging madness for grief, even if you doubted everything you saw along the way. I could envision myself welcoming the undead and waiting to be haunted by my past. Goodbye, sanity. See you later. <laughs> uh, I love Lisey's story. Um, I've really wanted to like the Apple TV 
show that they made of it last year. I really, really wanted to like it more. I just, Lisey story is such a weird book and like, it's not my favorite King, but it's the, the, the great moments of it are so wonderful. And it's some of King's best, just like prose writing. And I think it's just really hard to translate that into a television show. Makes and sense. I thought the show was very pretty to look at, but just didn't really function as a story for me. Yeah. Not everything suits itself to an adaptation. Uh, just stand 8460 says what's that going mad or already mad and going madder i can't in good consciousness pass good conscious pass up the opportunity to mention patrick bateman from american psycho side note it's wildly debated whether any of this crazy shit ever happens interestingly enough the author of the book was not 100 percent agreed with the ambiguity at the end of the adaptation the film has got to be in my top five favorites it's chilly funny gruesome disturbing and downright fascinating yeah uh american psycho man uh, yeah. great great movie yeah, I, that's it's, it, it is it's great. another one of those unfairly maligned movies that have been like it's like the typical like college dude bra in my top five movie, which doesn't make it a bad movie. This is the thing I have to say, like just because like shitty and or annoying people like a movie doesn't mean it's a bad movie. Yeah, I mean, first of all, all young people suck. OK, I think we can. Agree yeah, that's true. That, we're that, all dumb. We're all idiots. We're, we're all dumb when we're young. So it's, it, it hardly means anything to, to say, you know, college dude bras like it. It's like, OK, so what you mean is young people like it, which means it's compelling. So what's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I like this when I was a teen and I like it now. All right. Mm -hmm. I don't know about teen, maybe 20 ish. But yeah. Um, and I read, you know, what's funny. This the, the book, um, one of the few books I've ever stopped reading in the middle. Um, and it's not mm. that it's not like good. It's that it's so fucking disgusting. Um, like, like the, it goes so far into the direction of just like describing this horrible depraved shit that he does that the movie can't even really show cause it would be rated X. Um, mm. and I was just like, I don't need this in my head. And I stopped. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's another book I haven't re read and I'm going to not prioritize that. Yeah. Good choice. I mean, I don't, know. I don't know why that's so weird to me that I haven't read Fight Club or American Psycho. This just feel like books I definitely would have read. They're both but for whatever reason. I they're haven't. both genuinely disturbing books, which is sometimes you don't need that in your life, you know? Sure, sure. <laughs> All right. B, B, uh, B. C. Johnson says one of my favorite not losing their mind plots comes from Star Trek The Next Generation. The episode Remember Me. It's a classic episode where people keep disappearing from the ship, but no one except medical chief Beverly Crusher seems to remember them. First, her old mentor disappears, a visitor to the ship, so no one really knew the guy anyway. Then main cast members begin to disappear, and no one seems to care, notice, or remember. She's also seeing glowing vortexes around the ship, uh, which, of course, no one else ever witnesses. Beverly assumes she's going crazy and spends much of the episode questioning her perception and sanity. However, my favorite part of the episode is that while Beverly questions her sanity, the crew doesn't. When she brings the odd disappearances to the captain's attention, everyone goes into full problem-solving mode. It's a wonderful subversion of the usual doubt and even gaslighting that often come with a plot like this. The crew of the Enterprise is so used to high strangeness and they trust Beverly so much that they turn over every system on the ship to try to figure out to try to figure it out without a shred of evidence. Anyway, it turns out that Beverly is trapped in her own personal pocket dimension that is shrinking and the disappearances are just things being subtracted from her dimension. Eventually her son, <laughs> semi-lovable Er Mary Sue Wesley Crusher, <laughs> manages to save her and everything wraps up nicely with the usual techno babble yeah great episode great show yeah my favorite bit of it is is like toward the end when it's literally just her and picard on the ship and she's like isn't it weird that it's just you and me on the ship and he's like no it's always just been you and me <laughs> yeah i mean this is like uh, bc used the the term gaslighting which is really the question we're asking here i think we kind of avoided using that term in the uh, question itself because we didn't want to limit people but that's kind of what we're talking about here right this yeah. idea that like either you're purposely being gaslit or something is just happening to you outside of other people's control that is making you doubt your sanity but yeah. um yeah I, I i love this by the way I, I love this trope like generally like we've talked about this in other talks about about tv shows and stuff the idea that like there's there's the whole like sort of story that has someone being put in a mental institution that does not belong there but then they start to wonder if they do belong there right <laughs> and that's like one of my worst fears because it's like the more you protest about you being in a place that you don't belong 
the more you look like you belong there and like that just the idea of that is just so terrifying to me and i love i love when stories explore that yeah we'll see if people have suggested some of those particular sorts of movies because i was kind Mm -hmm. of expecting some of those yeah Uh, emperor fry the solid says the literary character that pops to mind is the main character of john fowles the magus nick meets a girl on vacation by coincidence right mistreats her goes on a walk about to greece happens across an older gent who's interested in nick's english youth perspective right the men in animal masks on the property are actors right it's like freud's own tarot deck came to life and wanted to break you it's so long and navel gazy i don't think i'll ever get anyone else to read it but i had a good time yeah i'm not sure (laughs) I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough even in your answer to get yeah. a, my head around what's actually happening in this thing. Yeah, you, you've managed to make me actually very curious by by not giving us enough detail. So mm-hmm. good job, Emperor Fry the Solid. Yeah, yeah. Hobo Demon says, the mouth of madness, the thing they live. All classic examples of this plot would be more easily explained as a psychotic break. <laughs> Uh, escape from New York, big trouble in Little China. Harder to fit in, harder to fit to the question, but I bet you five dollars someone could do it. So Hobo Demon is basically saying this is just what John yeah. Carpenter does. <laughs> it's the John Carpenter <laughs> idea. Yeah, now, that is funny. I mean, in the mouth of madness, definitely the thing. Yeah, that's actually a fun interpretation. I, I, huh. Now that you mentioned that, I'm like, yeah, I bet somebody's written that up somewhere because that's a really yeah, fun idea. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Brett7921 uh, says, I'm going with my favorite recent show, which is canceled before it was given a proper ending, FX's Legion. The show is about a super mutant and Charles Xavier's son, David Haller, Legion. I've never read the comic book series, but the show is brilliant and visually beautiful. David is diagnosed with schizophrenia and starts off in a mental hospital, but his insanity is part of his powers, which includes various psychic abilities like his father. To keep, it, to keep it short, David is confused about himself and reality, and most of the show is him in his head trying to figure it out. Also, I want to give a shout out to Aubrey Plaza's character in the show, Lenny Busker. Aubrey brings the madness of the show to an 11, and our performance is outstanding. Great show if you've never seen it. Did you ever watch Legion? No. Uh, the other day, I, I remember being like, oh, wow, this looks really cool. Is this a new show that's going to be coming out? And it was like, no, Matt. You totally missed it, and it's canceled now. Um, yeah, you, I think that was on a podcast actually, where I was like, "Matt, that was four years ago." <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I actually kind of know about the Legion character, and so I thought that sounded fun. Um, I haven't checked it out though. Yeah, I feel bad because like I'm one of the reasons the show was canceled because I started <laughs> I started watching it. I really enjoyed the first season. I think I was midway through the second season. I was really liking it. There was nothing about the show I wasn't enjoying, but just for whatever reason, I fell off and never caught back up to it. So like the, that's exactly why shows get canceled when people just stop watching it for no discernible reason. So God my bad. It. God damn it, Scott. I know. I know. Oh, well. Um, all right. Walk in Dude 22 says... In the film Angel Heart, a private investigator is hired by a Monsieur Louis Cipher, I don't know how to say that in a French accent, uh, (laughs) to investigate the status of a contract. The contract involves a singer who suffered shell shock during World War II. Each lead brings the detective Harry Angel closer to the dark and disturbing truth, and it isn't until the very end of the movie that we learn whether or not he's losing his mind. The movie is based on the novel Falling Angel by William Hortzberg. Uh, and then they they go on to a few other ones. Uh, Jacob's Ladder, 1990, is another example where the lead may be losing their mind, but the audience is let in on the truth at the close of the story. Uh, David Lynch's Lost Highway is another film where the audience has every reason to suspect, sorry, to question the mental illness, mental status of the protagonist. It is a mind fuck beyond compare. Even multiple viewings uh, may leave certain viewers puzzled about the reality of what they see. Um, and then... In the Mouth of Madness, a Lovecraft-inspired tale of the end of the world. Uh, the obviously crazy protagonist, Sam Neill, screams out, I'm not insane, uh, to which you hear the other inmates of the asylum replying, I'm not if he's not. How hysterical is that? I love In the Mouth of Madness. Yeah, it's um, it's very funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle Y says my favorite point of view character going mad is Captain Benjamin Sisko, a.k.a. Benny Russell in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. The alter ego of Benny Russell is introduced as part of a mini character arc for Sisko. Benny Russell is a black sci fi writer in the 1950s. Sisko finds himself living Benny's life and seeing his friends from DS9 represented in Benny's. Benny writes a story about a space station in the future and his editor won't publish it because it's too outlandish that a black man could ever be in charge. His story is scrapped and he gets fired. The vision fades 
and Cisco is returned to his existence on Deep Space Nine, but he wonders if he's being dreamt up by Benny way back in the past. In Shadows and Symbols, Season 7, Episode 2, Cisco is again dropped into Benny's life, only now Benny is confined to a mental institution, madly scribbling his stories on the walls while his doctor tries to persuade him that in order to be cured and released, he must end his fanciful future story. Cisco must sift through visions, determining what is real. This is the exact trope I fucking love, Matt. I love this. That's I don't I have to admit something. I don't think I've seen Deep Space Nine all the way through. I don't think I have because I don't think I've seen this episode. I haven't. Yeah, weirdly enough, I don't remember either of these. Um, it, no, I definitely haven't seen it all the way through. I mean, that's the funny thing about watching TV in the in the in the the before time was you just watched <laughs> what was on, and then maybe you you know you, you missed a few new episodes, and then if yeah. they didn't put those in the rotation, then you just never saw them. Um, so I, w- I was a fan of the show. I just think I I missed these for some reason Mm -hmm. yeah sounds cool i'm I'm gonna get to it eventually because i'm doing my uh watching all of trek thing right now and it's not going great i'm still on the next the next generation because i'm just slowly this is like after i finished watching all of the other tv i have watched i get in an episode of tng which doesn't happen very often because i don't know if you know this matt but there's a lot of tv out there right now i've heard yeah but I can't wait to get to this because that the exact thing in this in the season seven episode two thing is like exactly the type of truth I love in TV show so much. Yeah, me too. The TV show was actually you being insane the whole time. What's and I love I love when the shows like, yeah, say, hey, maybe that's actually true, even though it yeah. wouldn't work with anything from that point right. on. But it doesn't matter because you get this cool like, ooh, I like that idea. Ooh. That- I mean, it's it's kind of messed up because, of course, Benjamin Sisko is a fictional character. So, mm-hmm. you know. So he is. He's just someone's idea. Or maybe he's just on a, another level of the tower and the writers of the show are just writing the beam of the great ocelot. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. That makes me happy yes. to think. I like it. I love it. All right. Steve, I want some more of it. Me too. Steve L says, the first two people I thought of were Roland and Jake. That was epic. Uh, Rand in the Wheel of Time series is another. Yes, that is a good example. I agree. Uh, Harry Potter also went through that. Did he? Uh, I'm trying to think about. Oh, yeah. I no, rem- no. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I think I know what you mean. I'm I don't a- remember that, but I don't remember that. that sh- I, think I almost said show. I don't remember Harry Potter. I think it's right when well. he's having like visions that, that are making him think he's going crazy hmm. um my favorite would have to be the main character in the beginning of neverwhere such great writing um this they, they say then i took a turn and thought of the what the bleep do we know m- movie talking about people being labeled crazy because they're changing their life's perspective so drastically it may seem like they're going crazy but in truth they're just creating a new paradigm yeah i mean the the, the i guess the angle on this that we haven't really talked about yet is the idea that like crazy is kind of defined by you know a baseline of society in a lot of ways right like like th- behavior is seen as crazy if it doesn't align with what we expect so yeah we didn't really breach that that subject because i think most of these examples and most of the examples that we were thinking of is a person themselves thinking that they are crazy and that is different from other people looking at you and saying hey you're crazy man you're crazy yeah that's one thing 12 monkeys does concern is the idea that yeah. that um the psychiatrist character is 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 conflicted over the idea that she's you know her, her profession is the one that that defines what what insane means which is mm-hmm. which is a lot of power actually yeah and finally we have sigma who says i'm rereading the triple x holic manga But there's stuff in the sequel series, Triple X Holic Ray, that sort of fits this. I don't want to spoil it too much because the writing legitimately moved me. But if I remember correctly, Wantanuki's reality begins to break down. Events keep repeating, but in different ways. But we find out the plan all along that Wantanuki wasn't going crazy. Ray opens up rather strangely for anyone who has read the original series. And the shit clamps. Pulls in Ray to the next level. Emotional catharsis and a resurrection of grief. Too bad it's been on a five-year hiatus, but they're coming back, apparently. Peak fiction returneth. Uh, they go on to say, I know we banter about anime and manga, but Triple X Holic really means a lot to me, so I'd appreciate no laughs. No, I mean, look, we're having fun, right? Like, like here's the, here's the deal. I don't like anime. I, I don't. 
but like I would never, ever, ever like tell someone they're not allowed to enjoy something and everyone finds meaning in different things, right? Like everyone finds meaning and importance in different stuff that they, they ingest. So like, I like, I wish, I wish I could love anime because then I would have this whole new world of great stories to watch. I just don't, it's just not for me and that's fine. And, and I would like, that's I think sometimes it gets conflated when you like don't like something that you're saying that someone else is bad or wrong for liking it or making fun of them for liking it. No, not at all. Like, like chase your bliss, like your stuff. Like the world is yeah. too is too much of a pain in the ass to, I mean, to to worry about what other people think about the things. I mean, this like. is this thing we're doing right here is the nerdiest shit ever, and we're aware of that. <laughs> it's so like, nerdy. Like it's, yeah. it's not like me and Scott are like yeah, you know, uh, cool people though. Like. <laughs> the dark tower books about the the gunslinger who no we were yeah. like we all it, it's fun everybody have fun doing your thing there's yeah. no there's no judgment we're just we're, it, we're just joking just around like, yeah. just like insanity uh what is anime is is in the eyes of the beholder so you can just say dark tower is anime and then tell me i like it and totally I'll be like, well i guess you're right it's totally anime <laughs> real life is anime no. if you think about I, it I'm so glad you have something like this. That's, that's really important to you. And I think I, I wish that everyone had a piece of media or storytelling that was extremely important to them because yeah, man, like there's like, that's what stories can do. And that's why they're cool. And that's why I love them. So even if I don't like your particular story, I think it's awesome that you have one. And I don't actually know if I could love this thing. I've not yeah. read it. Who knows? S- Sigma does besmirch uh, the elven tongue. Um, in uh, toward the bottom of their comment, I'm just not gonna let that pass. You, you <laughs> As if it's not real. Of course, it's real. It's a real language. Um, people speak yeah. it. Anyway. Well, people <laughs> do not speak it. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure there are people who speak it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure of that. Matt, come, on. come on. You don't think there are people who have learned Elvish to a level where they can speak it? <sighs> it's a. It's I a mean, full language. I guess <laughs> yeah, people learn I mean, Klingon. Yeah, but that's not good. <laughs> people have taken the time to learn Klingon. Yes, they have. And, uh-huh. you know, chase your bliss and yeah. everything. <laughs> I'm just, see how far I can push you on this. I don't know if anyone's like chatting casually in Klingon or Elvish right now. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> hey, Matt, what's uh, what's next week's question? Next week's discussion question is... Who is the coolest character? And by cool, of course, we mean cool, not as the word means now, where it is a substitute for badass or just good, um, but cool like the Fonz. Yeah. A. If they don't go A at some point in the course of their their uh, existence, then they're not cool enough. Yep. And if it is the Fonz, try to if, if your answer is the Fonz. Explain to me why. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying I disagree. I'm just like, he's like the er cool. Right. In so like, why? Yeah. Why is that? Right. I mean, as usual, the question is, is really just to trick everyone into explicating their concept of the thing rather mm-hmm. than just strictly giving an example. So exactly. Exactly. All right, we are finally done. That is going to do it for us here this week. As we said, next week, Black House continues with chapters eight nine ten um i i don't i can't even say anything matt here here we go that's all i'll say (laughs) okay here we go go. strap in hold on to your butts all right uh remember you can reach out to us via kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on twitter at kingslingerspod and of course the subreddit is reddit.com slash r slash doof media and also, you should subscribe to this podcast because clearly if you're listening to this right now, you've listened to two hours of it, and so you like it, and so you should keep listening to it. And the easiest way to do that is to be reminded of when there are new episodes by clicking the subscribe button. It's free. It is free. That is something we should mention every once in a while. Um, and if you like the the uh, Kingslingers podcast and you want to support us, then please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks this month to new patrons, Elizabeth T, Will L, Tanner, Sarah B, Todd L, and Cacophony. Uh, Welcome. We hope you enjoy all the just immensely deep troves of of backlog of cool stuff that we have over on the Patreon. Yes, and uh, and please... 
please consider voting for Heavenly Creatures <laughs> when, when you vote for uh, the canon episode for this month. Yeah. There, there Jane, I, I did that for you. Hopefully, hopefully it'll work. Of course, if you cannot afford to donate right now, that is absolutely okay. You can help us out by sharing this podcast. We've had a lot of new listeners lately. We've seen a little uptick in our download numbers and some new people joining um, the community, some new emails from new listeners getting. So you guys are doing your work. Thank you so much. Please keep it up. And of course, please keep those rating and reviews coming. We, we've got a whole bunch of new ones, and I'm very excited about that. But please, please keep them coming. Uh, this week's spotlight review comes from Maria S. All, all the way over in the Ukraine, Matt. This is one of our, our international listeners who emailed us their iTunes review since iTunes won't let me see it. Um, all right. So thank you, Maria, for taking the time. Um, Maria gives us five stars and says, awesome. As a constant reader of King, I have become a constant listener of this podcast. Matt and Scott have kept me company all through the quarantine on my second journey to the tower, providing in-depth conversations on all possible King adjacent topics, as well as a good laugh, keeping fingers crossed for the third season to happen. Well, thank you so much, Maria. Yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate that. And then glad that we could um, bring some, some joy into your, into your pandemic existence. Yeah, yeah. And obviously season three is going to happen because it's going to just be us reading Pet Cemetery over and over and over oh, again. Jesus. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, folks, that's it for us. Have a good rest of your week and we will see you right back here next week for more Black House, more happy times, more Matt having existential crises, long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs> of existential crises. The crises? Is it crises or crises? It's just crises. I guess that makes sense. Crises. A papa mamax. A papa a, 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 a papa nax. A papa nakanax. A papa nakanax.